Well, good evening, everyone. It's 6.31 p.m., so I will call this meeting to order. Yeah, I see you. I'm just waiting for the CAO to come in. <laughs> and we'll begin with a motion from Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc, that Council amend the September 21st, 2020 agenda, Section 18, by pulling item 5.4, exception 2B of the closed, se closed meeting agenda, to open session under 9.9, .9, and that's with regard to the curling club. Is there any discussion on that? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Council LeBlanc, that Council amend the September 21st, 2020 agenda to add a verbal report from the clerk's department concerning council meetings and public attendance under 9.10. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. The Council amend the September 21st, 2020 agenda to remove correspondence item 16.1 from the agenda as per request from the Royal Canadian Legion. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion's carried. And I have a motion moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley, that Council approve the September 21st, Council, 21st 2020 Council agenda as amended. Deputy Mayor, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. So now I'll ask if there are any declarations of pecuniary interest, and if so, please state the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Anyone with any announcements this evening? Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, Your Honour. Uh, Mayor, uh, the, uh, on the 16th of uh, October, uh, Dave and Puccini is holding a drive at the um, no frills for giveaway pumpkins to raise money for the uh, the food bank, and also on Saturday, this Saturday, there's a, a fundraiser for the dog park to get benches and stuff at uh, Pollywogs uh, for um, for fennels. They're going to be making fennels, those little cakes with the, the strawberries and stuff, and the, the profits and the tips will go towards the dog park to to get them two new benches. This Saturday, yeah, between 11 and 2. Thank you. Any other announcements? Councillor Tadman? Thank you, Mayor. I just would, would like to hear from somebody from the Amplifest Committee and want to, yeah, well, Deputy Mayor looks like she would be anxious to say what's going on this year, so just for everybody's information especially. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the Applefest Committee, um, we very regrettably had to cancel Applefest this year. So we came up with uh, this idea, actually it was kind of Councillor Rowley who came up with most of the idea and we ran with it to uh, do Applefest a little different this year. And uh, we are, um, we have this ongoing contest um, uh, where we have uh, people decorating their homes or businesses and sending in photos, getting some really good photos and some really good uh, feedback on that. 
And on Saturday, so that would be this coming Saturday, we want everyone to wear red and to shop local. And we're going to have Apple Fest without the gatherings. So um, it'd be great to see everyone out uh, and doing that this weekend. Councillor Tadman. So you have to submit a picture or you don't, and who's the judges? We decided no judges because we didn't want to judge. We're just going to randomly draw. We have a bunch of prizes. We're going to randomly draw from those who have submitted pictures and uh, we will announce the winners probably after Apple Fest. Is that what we decided? Our deadline is Apple Fest, so probably in the, the next week. Yeah, the next week sometime. Yeah, I, I just would like to suggest I saw a picture online, but I don't think it was submitted. Uh, Councillor LeBlanc has quite a display and is adding to it constantly. So. Um, maybe someone could take a picture of that if he's too shy, knowing him he probably is. Well, well, we probably should leave it up to him and his spouse whether they want to enter or not. Um, but uh, we have had some great entries and he's certainly welcome to. Thank you. Any other announcements this evening? Thank you both or all. We'll move into adoption of the minutes. I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc, that Council Approve the September 8th, 2020 Council Meeting Minutes. As amended to change Resolution COU 2020-288 to read defeated and Resolution COU 2020-292 to read Construction Price Index Plus 1%. Is there any discussion? Although, go ahead. I've, I've got them. I've written them here. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion's carried. And I have a motion moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The Council approved the September 14th, 2020 planning meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? Councillor Tadman? Thank you, Mayor. I just noticed on the resolution 2266, there's no seconder on the motion. What's the resolution number, Councillor? Uh, 66. The, the planning meeting, right? Planning meeting, yeah. Uh, Councillor Le, LeBlanc moved it, but here there's no seconder. I think it's just an omission by mistake. We can, uh, we can make that as amended and you'll check the records to correct that. Okay. Councillor LeBlanc, you okay as amended? Councillor Rowley? So that reads as amended. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion's carried. There is no statutory public meeting this evening, so we move into delegations. Our first delegation is Jennifer Bishop from Hastings Children's Aid Society, and I don't see her. So if it's okay with council, we'll move on, and if uh, Ms. Bishop shows up, we'll allow her to do her delegation. So our second, now first delegation is Cheryl Langevin regarding the Harbor Point Pond proposed development plan and public survey. Cheryl? No. There How you am go. I doing? All right. You're well. You're here. And just a reminder, you have 10 minutes to 10 minutes. provide That's your delegation. Oh, great. Thank you. So the subject I'm speaking about, of course, is the Harbour Point Pond Proposed Development Plan Public Survey. Good evening, Mayor Ostrander, uh, Deputy Mayor, Mr. Castleman, Council Members and Staff. My name is Cheryl Longevin. I reside at Six Cove Crescent, Brighton. To date, you have received many emails on this subject from the stakeholders. Most recently, one dated the 19th of September, 220 from Mrs. Richardson, including grass cutting. 
which Mr. Poole writes, residents are using municipal property as a continuance of their lawns. Residents are cutting this property in accordance with the Clean Yard Bylaw as the municipality is not keeping with MOE's guidelines on its website. In addition, Mr. Poole does not seem to be concerned by Brighton by the Bay hiring Condo Corps to do its grass cutting, etc., on this municipal property, and that a resident of Orchard Gate Pond is cutting around the pond. As the Deputy Mayor has stated, all ponds should be treated the same way. Dr. Longevin, and I use doctor because he does research and, um, and delves into uh, surveys and research projects has sent in two emails questioning the validity of the survey that was sent to approximately 5,000 ratepayers. He has indeed analyzed it in depth and certainly has come up with the stats that are not portrayed within the report. Even before his analysis, I had deep reservations about this survey. Approximately 250 replies, when 5,000 conflicting numbers, by the way, were sent out. Regardless, this represents a very high percentage of ratepayers that are really not interested in what happens around the Harbour Point water treatment facility. What did this survey accomplish? Nothing but money spent that could have been used in other ways. So let's talk about option one, which is the enhanced development. Construction of an accessible pathway of limestone screenings. In the photo that is attached to the survey, in section B-B, a retaining wall is to be made to meet the existing grade. This cost does not appear to be factored in, and it is now mentioned that the project is based on budget limitations. What budget? The estimated cost reported is 31755 In my estimation, that's an underestimated cost, especially since a retaining wall is to be constructed. The slope must be kept patent for the water to flow in the direction of the catch basin. By the way, have any of you tried to walk on a limestone pathway pushing a wheelchair? pushing a baby carriage, walking with a cane or a walker, or with shuffling feet. Every goose, each goose, produces two pounds of excrement per day. How easy or long do you feel it will take to clean the goose excrement from the limestone pathway? To be noted, the pathway in the photo appears to be made of cement or pavement. Is this another, let's leave it out, what the pathway will be made of? Was it originally to be cement or pavement, and now is this an attempt to keep the cost down? Option two. Limited development. Provide minimal development landscape improvement. Now this is what the stakers have asked for all along. If this development option, if these development options are listed in the report, why were they not included in the survey sent out to the ratepayers? Why were the costing and the extra annual costing not attached? Why were the ratepayers not told that these expenses will fall onto their backs and taxes will increase? Who made the decision to leave the above information out of the survey? We remain under the impression that this survey was sent out to manipulate the ratepayers into accepting something that was not fully thought out for our benefit, and so we question for whose benefit. When the Harbour Point Treatment Water Facility was in discussion as to its enlargement with Toby Development, no survey was sent out to the ratepayers to advise them of what was happening to the facility and what the plans were and asking if they were in agreement and why the HPP required enlargement. So why now a survey? When the facility was being enlarged, a resident wrote Mr. Toby's public Facebook page to ask if there would be any plans to make a small park on the adjacent lands, i.e. putting in benches or a walkway. Mr. Toby responded, the Harbour Point Stormwater Management Facility is a municipal infrastructure. It is not parkland. We have, however, incorporated parkland and walkways into our Hamilton Woods development. It would appear that Mr. Toby is not in favour of the Harbour Point Water Treatment Facility being made into a recreational area. As stated many, many times, a water management facility should never be used for recreational purposes as it can interrupt the process the wet pond executes. And as I mentioned in my email of the 16th of September to the mayor, the CAO, and councillors, there are other ways to spend municipal money. I supported Councillor Tadman who stated the most important and serious problem today is finding ways to help alleviate the financial stress to many folks of the Brighton municipality who have lost their jobs are unable to pay their bills and may even lose their homes. This should have been and should be a top priority of council, not sending out an invalid survey which today has cost the taxpayers in excess of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, or whatever cost we may get. This estimate that I've made takes into account paper, envelopes, photocopying, etc., and does not take into consideration staff time and salaries. So plainly speaking, what we see is that Council will vote to allow 4% of the ratepayers within 1,000 metres of the Harbour Point Pond 
who responded to the survey, to make decisions for the other 96% who did not respond to having their taxes increase throughout the Brighton municipality. I believe we live in a democratic society and I believe every person in this room believes it as well. We trust you will make the right and just decision this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lagervin. I'll read the motion. I'll ask you just to hold tight in case members of council have a question okay. for you. Actually, I'll open the floor right now for members of council if you have any questions. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, second by Councillor Bateman, that, the count, that Council receive the delegation from Cheryl Langevin regarding the Harbour Point Pond proposed development plan and public survey. Is there any discussion? All in favour? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Our next dele delegation is Laura Wang regarding food refreshment business. Laura? And Laura, just as a reminder, you have 10 minutes to complete okay, your delegation. Okay, good enough. <laughs> um, as council know that before, I, I ran this business uh, three years ago. And this year is pandemic year. I noticed uh, a little bit different and also some new challenging things. That's why I got this chance to delegate. And uh, this is the letter addressed to the council. So I really Laura, can I ask you just to speak closer to the microphone? Oh. I think some people are having a hard time hear? hearing you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Try, try now. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm a small business owner selling food for three years in place to place. In the middle of August 2020, I addressed the council my handwriting letter challenging uh, in operating my refreshment mo mobile uh, business seasonal only um, in the downtown park near the corner Lola's under the new passed by law no one replied me yet um, and no chance for me to delegate but now I got it today um, so at the beginning, I did the business with a lot of inconvenience, hard work again. So I'm writing to you again here for telling even further more challenging that I had in the, uh, in the past few weeks so that I can find a solution for operating my business continuously. Um, this year, I just opened my business a couple of days there early on in August after all legal permanent paper were completed. Then the issues come up from Hess unit, which gave an unfire closure order unhelpful to such small business. I fight along with them in a meeting on August 28th, whole afternoon. They want me to um, use in enclosure the kitchen uh, way to continue my business or only operating the business in a special gathering event like Apple Fest, uh, etc., uh, as, as it a uh, food tent way. Both ways are, are more harder for me to do it because, so, like I said, this pandemic year event is hard to get and the food trailer in such short time to let me change from my food tent into the enclosed enclosed the food kitchen, food kitchen, uh, kitchen it seems is, is unbelievable to acceptable for such a small business owner. It's, it's very tiny, small new business. So, so fortunately, after that uh, meeting, I got a second used uh, food trailer from local area quickly. I paid and I towed back to the park for continuing my business. And trouble and challenging comes up again after the trailer joined the park uh, with the police and the bylaw office and also some uh, residents around me. Um, they forced us to tow it away from there. This trailer is, uh, that day is pleased to meet health unit requirement, but not please the township. And the uh, township officer and the placement due to some rules and the regulations. At that time, I'm not quite sure. So I'm stuck in the business relocation with that uh, 
singular as the trailer. The conflicts lie in the conflicts lies in below uh, numbers. The first, um, no any kind of vehicle uh, is allowed to park in the Memorial Park in any time, let alone doing business with such kind of food trailer with with the even though the singular uh, exo trailer. So that's the rule one, it's, conflict, uh, it's conflicted. So the second, the public parking, public parking places of municipal town only available for daytime using only probably from 7 to 10 p.m. Overnight parking is forbidden. Uh, that's what I know. And this lead to the trailer daily towing back and forth to do the business is not suitable for me to do the business like a tent to turn down and set up every day. The third, uh, the private parking lot is uh, optional. It's options. Hearing that uh, most of private business parking lot uh, I did a circuit search, and uh, most of them are limited to subleased by the insurance policy, uh, so and so. And um, some of them are taking time and effort to negotiate with them, uh, with the landlord successfully. So this seems impossible happened in such urgent short time for me to do that. So all above showing my business stuck to an acceptable uh, at the public place. And the trailer is still not in use yet, even though past the house unit um, uh, inspection. Um, but later on, we deal with the local fire department. It seems uh, we had some challenging to get uh, uh, the fire department approval, uh, which is uh, landing in the TSSA, uh, TSSA inspection. So I'm here today. I'm just looking for the solution from the council here. Can I get some solution um, from from council here? So make my business with my business in trailer method use to to let me move on to do my business. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I will open the floor to members of council to ask questions of you. Um, we cannot, under the rules of procedure, direct staff. Yeah. out of a delegation and um, council doesn't have a magic wand that can fix all, all the uh, various and sundry concerns. Um, I, I do believe staff is endeavoring to follow all the rules and, and help you along follow all, all the rules and I trust the staff will continue to, to do that and work yeah. with you to do that. Um, but I will open the floor to members of council to see if we have any questions. There are no there are no questions. So uh, thank you very much, and I will read the motion. And I will say that I think um, I think we endeavored to do the right thing with our food truck bylaw, but we might want to take a look at that after this season and make some uh, make some changes uh, for the next season. I don't I just you know live and learn, <laughs> live and learn. Thank you, Laura. They all. Yeah. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The Council received the delegation from Laura Wang regarding food refreshment business. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. I know I don't need to ask, I just wait patiently. <laughs> So I have five citizens' comments, all with regard to Harbor Point Pond. I will note that we provide ten total of ten minutes for citizens' comment with two minutes each. Um, so you can all get in, uh, in under the citizens' comment section. Uh, it was my intention also when the staff report came up to 
ask council to suspend the procedural bylaw to allow people to speak. So if, if you'd rather speak then and not at the citizen's comment, um, that would be acceptable. But if you prefer to speak now at the citizen's comment, that's also okay. So if you'd rather wait when I call your name, just say so. Um, and if someone does speak to your point during citizen's comment, I would ask that you not reiterate the point, just let us know that your point, uh, your point has been made. So Sue Rickman, 132 Cedar Street. Go ahead, Councillor Tadman. Thank you, before uh, uh, Susan comes up to speak, so if they speak now, they will still be at liberty to speak during when we amend the... the if, if, if we go down that road, if everyone speaks yeah, okay. now, um, what I'll do is I'll ask if there's anyone else, and if there is, then we'll, we'll open the floor. So and the same person may think of something else and be able to come back. Thank you. You bet. Yes? Just for clarity, if they speak now, how much time do they have? And if they speak later, how much time do they have? So if they speak now, they have two minutes to a maximum of ten minutes for the entire session. Uh, if they speak later, we'd be suspending the rules and there would be no procedural way for me to shut that down, I'm afraid. You open the door. <laughs> Sue, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Council and uh, Mayor, for allowing me to speak today or this evening. I just wanted to mention to you, my husband and I had uh, purchased our property on Cedar Street back in 1999. That was one of, we were one of, back of our place there was absolutely no homes. There was all trees. Very small uh, storm water retention area. And having said that, when we, what sold us on purchasing our land and building our home then was the factor that nobody would be able to build out back of our property and we would have the privacy of having that waterway or that water um, retention area back there. And now that this has come forward um, with possibly putting a walkway around it, we are very, very upset with that because it's taking away from our privacy. We can't enjoy sitting out back on our deck and enjoy some quiet time and it also invades the uh, situation of possibly people uh, when we're not around or whatever coming up into our property. So having said that, we are very um, upset with the fact that um, people are planning on possibly putting a walkway around the pond and inviting people from outside of our area to use it. Um, there's a lot of areas in Brighton that people can go to to walk their dogs. We've got the dog park now. We've got the local parks, the um, one from uh, um, Presqu'il and other areas that people can go and walk their dogs or walk around. I don't feel that they need to take our area that's out back of our property and build a walkway around there. There's a lot more uh, infrastructure and area that the council or the township taxpayers can have their money spent on than there. And I just want to say we're not really in agreement at all about this being put in out back of our, our property line. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Sue. Next comment comes from Sylvana Aiken, 106 Raglan Street. Worship, councillors and staff. My name is Sylvana Aiken. I reside at 106 Raglan Street. My backyard faces the Harbour Point Storm Water Facility. The people surrounding the pond have obviously spoken. The answer is no. We do not want a fence nor a walkway directly behind our residence. Now, if you lived around this pond, would you want people gawking around your place? Of course not. This is not cottage country where people get to walk all over green space. People live around this pond. It is a permanent residence. We have made this our home. We want our security, privacy, and peace of mind that no vandalism, crime, littering, loitering, and disturbance of the peace is created by this proposed project. Additionally, residents that have voted in favor of a walkway and a fence have no idea what their tax 
increase may be if this proposed plan is carried through. As a citizen, I am not in favor of this idea. Financial times are tough enough with COVID. I am sure that most residents cannot afford to pay any higher taxes. Now we've all heard expressions, if you build it, they will come. In this case, it's best to stick to the term, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let's keep the peace. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. The next citizen's comment comes from Carol Dryden, 10 Cove Crescent. Hi everybody, my name is Carol Dryden. My husband Mike and I live at 10 Cove Crescent. Our property backs onto the Harbor Point stormwater facility. 15 years ago we purchased this property and paid a premium because of the green space. We were hoping to do, we were happy to do so because of the peaceful lifestyle we looked forward to. With the permission of Tony Wallace, the developer, and the assurance that when the pond was expanded, it would go north of the hill and to the west toward Nautical Lane, we invested several hundred dollars in trees which we planted across the hill and onto the open space. All of our neighbors enjoyed the beauty of these trees for many years, and the birds returned to the area along with the wildlife. To the delight of everyone circling the area, we decorated the trees each Christmas with colored lights, which were enjoyed by everyone. Life was good. That all ended abruptly after the holidays last year when two large backhoes came into the property and started upending the trees and dumping them. With no warning to any of us, we had no time to take down bird feeders, remove lights from trees, or prepare for what was happening. It was only through the kindness of the workmen that we salvaged our lights and our feeders, our birdhouses, and some of the trees were transplanted. Life as we knew it took a drastic change. What's done is done and we can't change the way it happened. But what happens next should proceed with the best interests of everyone being a priority. Excuse me. We now have 140 plus geese to cope with each and every day. Having them invade our property made it impossible for us to enjoy our backyard. After spending all summer chasing geese 20 times more a day, we decided to fence the back of our property. The cost to us was $2,800 plus. Thanks a lot. They now Ms. roam Mrs. behind Dry the Mrs. Dryden, are you coming to the end of your comments? Pardon me? Are you coming to the end of your comments? Are yes, I am. Okay, thank you. They now roam behind the fence, defecating everywhere, and you think people would like to walk around there? I don't think so. Do you have a plan in place to deal with? We, the homeowners, are left with this problem to deal with. I guess I'm out of time. These are the four things that I think that you should be thinking about, and that's our privacy, our security, the maintenance, the geese, and accountability. Why was this project started when you didn't have an end plan? Why are you taking surveys now after you've dug the hole? Why not have a survey before you start? Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Dryden. Next comment comes from Paul Langevin, Six Cove Crescent. Only one page. My name is Paul Langevin, Six Cove Crescent. My comments concern the Harbor Point Public Survey. In my opinion, the survey and follow-up reports are seriously flawed. This survey is designed to confuse the public in order to achieve a desired result. Option one is clearly the goal of this expensive survey. Two points to keep in mind. First of all, the survey population. This is the number of people who are asked to complete the survey. This critical number is not in the report. It must be around 4,500. Nevertheless, the response rate of 4%, or approximately 250 responses, is report reported. 
This means that 96% of the survey population have no interest in this development whatsoever. Remember, we are talking about 250 responses from no more than 1,000 meters from the pond. This is a skewed sample that is not representative of the Brighton community. Number two, yes versus no responses. It is reported that 60% of the yes responses demonstrate a desire for a significant enhancement of the facility. This means 40% gave a no response, and this is a significant rejection of the enhancement. The 60% yes response is calculated by only including the five and 1,000 meter responses. What happens if you put in the abutting the pond responses in calculating the total distribution of yes and no responses? Yes responses are now 51.3%. No responses are now 48.7%. No significant difference. Quite a different picture if you are looking for support for option one. Now imagine if these not yes responses were told that their taxes would go up in order to pay for the enhancements. Wouldn't it be reasonable to expect, expect that the yes responses would go down and the no responses would go up? Are you coming to the end of the I am coming to the end. Thank you. Do you think that this is why there is no mention of costs in the survey? In summary, research can be designed and data interpreted to get the desired outcomes for any purpose. Caveat emptor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. And our final citizen's comment is from Brenda Richardson, 104 Raglan Street. Mrs. Richardson. Good evening. My name is Brenda Richardson and my husband and I reside at 104 Raglan Street. The majority of the stakeholders feel that this walkway is a security risk to our homes and property. Two days ago, the OPP posted on social media that they were seeking information on three youths fleeing from the industrial park after vandalism had been committed that happened in June of this year. This is only a block away from the Harbour Point stormwater facility and our properties. As reported in the Bright Now, vandals did thousands worth of damage at the municipal building and washrooms at the canteen at King Edward Park also had damage. It was reported that these youths even walked on the roof of the arena. They did it just because they could do it. This is said by Mr. Miller. Vandalism remains a hot topic, stated CAO Bob Castleman. Mr. Miller also went on to say it's an issue that is, isn't going away. Unfortunately, it can happen at any time. Stakeholders should never be put in the position that their homes and property are at a risk due to vandalism. They can stake out our property during the day and come back at night and do their damage, which will be a direct result of this walkway which staff has proposed. These places have received this damage, have street lights. It is extremely dark along the stormwater facility, and if the police were called, these vandals will get away by cutting through our yards and could then run through the park on Raglan. No chance of catching them at all. Many moved here because it offered security with nothing behind them. This will no longer be the case. We have, win we have widows that live here and have said that they will no longer feel safe if this walkway goes ahead. We should not be put in the position of having to purchase costly security equipment and fencing. I submitted my sub citizens' comments from September the 8th as Mayor Ostrander requested. I asked for the total cost of this proposal proposed development and the survey. To date, no answer has been received. The total cost is not on the agenda or who will be doing the work. I feel no answer was given because the answers are unknown. Stakeholders want and have repeatedly asked for it, asked for this, the grass to be cut as it done in previous years and the pond maintained per MOE regulations. Tonight, you as councillors can ensure the, can ensure the safety, sorry, Tonight, you as councillors can ensure the safety of the citizens that voted you in, but most importantly, stop a total waste of taxpayers' dollars. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Richardson. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council receive the citizens' comments from the September 21st, 2020 Council meeting. Is there any discussion? All those in favour? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. 
and I saw Jennifer Bishop walk in. So we'll go right back to delegations with the Hastings Children's Aid Society. Jennifer, welcome. I apologize. I was up at the uh, other <laughs> building waiting and thinking, oh, okay, you're closed. Session was just taking longer, but I managed to get a message to uh, Deputy Chief Ogden. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Deputy Chief, for directing traffic. <laughs> Hi, good evening, Your Worship and fellow council um, members. I hope everybody is doing okay, with, especially with this new normal. It's hard to get used to. I'm Jennifer Bishop, and I'm a resource worker with Highland Shores Children's Aid. Um, I'm here to present about Child Abuse Prevention Month, and I just want to thank you um, for allowing us to come and speak about this important campaign again this year. Oh, perfect. So Child Abuse Prevention Month campaign originally started with um, a focus that, over what children's aid societies do when cases of abuse and neglect come to our attention. Over the past few years, we've moved away from that, and now we're focusing on with the, or for the last few years, the Purple Ribbon Campaign and being able to explain what um, CAS does along with other resources in the community to help um, children and families that are at risk. This year we're, we're shifting again and our focus is to keep children and youth at home. This year's campaign will complete, uh, sorry, um, we're focusing on that children's aid societies are the one of many of the resources available to support families chasing, um, facing challenges. Um, as well as the role that individuals in the community can play um, to help these families access uh, services that they may need. Um, we dress in purple to show families that are facing challenges that we care and we can help. We aim to raise awareness about the supports available and how to access them, and also to let people in our communities know of their importance supporting these families. Um, this campaign is through the month of October, um, the signature color is, is purple, and we ask that everybody wear uh, purple on Dress Purple Day. So there are 38,000 children that are 15 years of age or younger living in the areas served by Highland Shores. Our catchment area is just north of Bancroft down into Prince Edward County from Port Hope um, through to Shannonville. So we have quite a large jurisdiction. 5.7% of those children come to the attention of our agency each year for a concern about their well-being and safety. In recent years, um, volume and the, the unique needs um, of a certain population group required us to put together a dedicated team which provided safety and wellness services to 186 youth aged 15, 16, and 17. And in 2018 and 19, 10 youth aged 16 and 17 either entered care or had a voluntary youth service agreement with the society to be able to help them. So there are many reasons that families come to our attention and this um, pie chart will show that the largest um, is emotional harm and caregiver capacity. Those are concerns um, where the emotional well-being of a child may be at risk and also um, the caregiver capacity, so a parent's ability to be able to meet the needs and understand the needs of their child. But you can see that only 20% of the referrals that we receive are related to the extreme abuse that most people associate with child welfare. The majority of children that receive service from us is a result of families being unable to meet the physical and emotional needs. Um, some of the difficulties that families face include mental health concerns, addiction, social isolation, trauma, and extreme financial stress. In the fiscal year of 2019 and 2020, the Society recorded 3,903 child protection intakes. 61% of these intakes were assessed as requiring service, whether that was um, for investigation, a link within the community, those types of services. More than 1,350 families are assessed for a concern about the 
about their children each year and approximately 637 families are provided with ongoing services and support. And about 93% of all open families with Highland Shores, they're remaining in the home. And the main reason children were admitted to care in, the, in that fiscal year is caregiver capacity, which makes up 43% of children in care. Um, analysis in admission to care spoke to the complexity of the needs of children, resulting in a number of situations where children come into care due to lack of service rather than child protection concerns. Um, this chart will show where our actual referrals come from, and the majority of our referrals are coming from law enforcement and educational personnel. So that shows who is doing most of the call-ins for us. Highland Shores, with the help of our community partners, provide a broad range of services to children and families where there are concerns about safety and well-being. Even during the pandemic, we continue to visit children and families in their homes while observing the current health recommendations. Our child welfare workers help, help families obtain the services they need, such as parenting or treatment programs. During the pandemic, there have been many challenges which have potentially created new or different issues for families to manage. Some of the challenges families encounter are, as a result of COVID-19 are financial stress, isolation, and limited ability to access services during these times. We expect that September to December will be a pressure point in a number of areas, both in child welfare and in the community. Highland Shores is hoping to work with the community in helping to address these concerns and support families in ways that are most beneficial to them. This breaks down where the families are within our jurisdiction. Um, and as expected, 65% of the families are from the Hastings Hastings County, 21% are from Northumberland County, 9% are from Prince Edward, 4% are out of the jurisdiction, and 1% aren't listed. So what you can do is you can call Highland Shores if you have any concerns that a child or youth may be in need of protection or assistance. Reach out to your neighbors and friends and ensure that they're coping and not in need of further support. Um, your call to Highland Shores um, could lead to the help of help for families or some children. So join us to help raise awareness by wearing purple on Tuesday, October 27th. Um, T-shirts can be purchased from the Children's Foundation, and the number is listed there as well as accessing their website. Some of the other things that are going on provincially this year um, is that we're challenging um, people or teams or groups of people to get together um, and record a video and say how you help, what you do, and these videos can be uploaded to OACAS or we can upload these videos to the Foundation webpage and or the agency website. So we're encouraging or maybe even challenging community partners, mayors, MPPs, uh, business partners, and many other people to support Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, and use the hash hashtags, our hashtag, I dress purple because, or hashtag, per dress purple day 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for everything you do in the community, you and your colleagues. It's Thank appreciated. Uh, members of council, do you have any questions for the delegation? Thank you again. Perfect. It's appreciated. If we, I'm not sure if it was included in the letter or not, but if we are, um, would like to be able to decorate the downtown area again for the month of October. Madam Clerk. Possible. Council passed that at the last meeting. Okay. So we have already declared through motion October as Child Abuse Prevention Month and permitted the use of the, the purple ribbons. Awesome. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I have a motion moved by Council Rowley, and I'll need a seconder that Council receive the delegation from Jennifer Bishop, Hastings Children's Aid Society, to raise awareness of Child Abuse Prevention Month. Is there a seconder? Deputy Mayor? Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried.
And that brings us to staff reports. Our first staff report is with regard to Brighton Cruise Night. Mr. Miller, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, it's all in the report. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council receive the report from the Director of Parks and Recreation and allow for the scheduling of weekly cruise nights at the front parking lot area of King Edward Park on Monday evenings from 5 to 8 p.m. In, two in 2021, as per the correspondence received from Jennifer du Dusenberry dated August 17th, 2020. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. I just wanted to mention, with the new restrictions from the, the Ford government, and a lot can change between now and then, that we just make a note that it's based on what our current status is, so that we just don't. Yeah, so this, this would allow staff to go ahead and do it, but of course, the protocols would be in place uh, based on whatever whatever the change, whatever the norm is at, the, at that moment, yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, that was kind of my question, and, and just, you know, at one point we received this, uh, what I don't know how many years ago, it's in here, um, that, uh, but we were concerned about sports fields. You're saying that's not an issue because of the timing. You know, if it becomes an issue, of course, this would kind of come back to council. Uh, I just know how busy th this parking lot is when we do have sports going on, so that's my only comment. I'm in favor of it. It's just I want to make sure that we cover ourselves. Thank you, Councillor LeBlanc. For you, Mayor, uh, the question is for the CAO or, or for uh, uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, when, I was, when I was at Codrington, they knew this was coming up in the, the Codrington Center. Uh, they've asked me to see if this could be amended or added. It would be a separate one. They would like to have four days in 2021 so they could have hold at events like a show and shine or a band like for one event at the Codrington uh, Community Center. Is same this time that would be added to this or separately? Same group? Same, it'd be the same group, yeah. But they'd be working with Codrington. Um, then they should approach the Codrington Community um, they did. Center group. No, I mean the president of Codrington Community Association because they would make that decision through uh, with Mr. Miller's assistance. Okay. That wouldn't be up to us. Okay. Okay. We've sort of delegated authority for that location to the CCA. So they should approach, uh, I'm not even sure who the president is right now. It's Debbie Dupuy. They, they can go, yep. they can try to request to come on as a delegation at our next meeting or whenever yeah. it suits them. Yeah. Yeah. And, it was them to us. And Councillor Bateman, you're the council rep on the CCA, so they could even reach out to Councillor Bateman for that purpose, yeah. Is there any further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Our next report is with regard to Anavet's publication advertising. Ms. Woodafield, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council receives or, or supports the funding for advertising in the Anavet's publication for a total expense of $406.02. Councillor Anderson, this is your motion. Do you want to receive or support? The, you want to receive it? You okay with that, Councillor Bateman? I prefer to support it, but it's not my motion. You are the seconder. Are you willing to stay on as the seconder? Pardon me? Are you willing to remain the seconder to the motion if it says receive? If somebody else wants to, I, I would rather support, so if somebody wants to second it as receive. You may. You'll need to, you'll need to speak through your microphone, yeah. sir. Uh, if you read the report here, it also puts us uh, over budget for this year. Uh, for this uh, on this line item, uh, it's only September. I'd, we've also contributed uh, a certain amount of money. Also, uh, council has approved uh, publications already for nine hundred sixty-two dollars. So that's why I said we should just receive it. I think during these times and we're talking about some restraint and if we're over budget on a line, I think it's time to uh, maybe we should be holding back on some things. So. That's why I say we should receive it. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. So Councillor Anderson has moved a motion to receive. Uh, Councillor Bateman is withdrawing as the seconder. Is there a seconder? Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to that? 
Uh, I just want to say I, I agree. We just we have so many things that come at us. I think um, this is just one that this time that we we can't do it. We do have to kind of to hold back. I know it's only a couple hundred dollars, but we just have to look at things more closely. That's my opinion. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So it's moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. The council received the funding for advertising and Annavet's publication for a total expense of $406.02. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Tadman. This is important to me, so I'd like a recorded vote, please. Sure. Is there any further discussion before the recorded vote? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Mary Tadman. Uh, sorry, Clerk, but would you read the motion? Because I want to make sure. I think it says just receive, right? It does. Could you read it so we're yep. all familiar again with what it says? The Council receives the funding for advertising in the Anavits publication for the total expense of $406.02. And may I comment? Thank you. Um, Certainly we need to be physically responsible, but we do have veterans that are struggling and uh, if, if in any way this helps them, which it does, I certainly want to support this. So to receive it means that's it, it goes away. So I say uh, for this one, for the receive, no, I, I don't want to just receive it. Okay. I think there was another time when something like this happened and some counselor didn't realize how the vote was going to go, so I, I really want to make everybody aware that. Okay. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? No. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? No. Councillor Emily Rowley? No. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's defeated. I assume someone would like to put another motion on the floor that says support. Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. May I have a blank motion form? Don't give them all to me. <laughs> it's a bad omen. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council su supports the funding for advertising in the Annavets publication for a total expense of $406.02. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Bateman. I just wanted to speak to why I am in favor of this. I fully understand the fiscal responsibility because we spoke multiple times to that. And one phrase we always hear, and we've all heard it several times, is that our municipality quote unquote as a seniors town. I don't entirely agree with that quote because we have a lot of youth here, but one thing that is just as factual, if not more so, is this is a military town. Our proximity to CFB Trenton, not just our veterans, but our active military personnel. Uh, that's why I'm supporting this. We have a lot of military family, past and present, currently in this municipality. Thank you, Councilor Bateman. Councilor Rowley? I would just ask once again for a recorded vote when we do this. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Anderson. I'll just weigh in again. Uh, this is money going to a publishing company for advertising. We're paying for some a spot in a magazine that is supporting the veterans, and I'm 100% supporting the veterans. I suggest we give them a donation rather than give it to a publisher 
and 90% or 95% of that money is going in their hands to put that out. And of, of course, the group will put their message in that magazine or newsletter or whatever. This helps them be able to do that. But th this money, I do not believe, is getting to where we want it to get to 100%. And that's why I say uh, I don't agree in us using municipal money for the, these purposes at times. But I never believed in it in business either. It's got to have a, a real direct cause, and, a, and the money's got to go to the, where you want it to go, and this is not going exactly where you want it to go. I'm quite emotional about it. Veterans deserve all 100% from us. And uh, to look at it differently, and that's what I'm going to do, and I'll put, I'll put my foot out saying that, uh, that we're, doing, we're doing this. If we had the money and in a perfect world, that's what we used to do. We, we would hand out money to these groups. I don't believe in it. And I believe in giving it, it's just like any cause. Give it to the cause, quit giving it to the people in the middle, the middleman. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Tadman. I have to disagree with um, the councillor who just spoke uh, right here in, in the comment that says Ennevet financially supports veterans, hospitals, and lobby on behalf of servicemen and women who serve or have served in the Canadian Army, Navy, or Air Force. Uh, we have spent a lot of money, and maybe this isn't the time, but a lot of money on a survey and stamps, which I understand Councillor Anderson very much supports, and yet we, we're not going to put 400 and something dollars. This is ridiculous. Any further comment? Councillor LeBlanc. Being one of those war veterans, but only the, the first Bush War. But anyway, the thing is, as a vet, I get this publication. It gives us a lot of valuable information that I don't go to committee meetings, that I read what's going on for our pensions, for PTSD, the family support units. It's all published in here, and it supports the hospitals in them. So that's why I want to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Rowley, you were the one that re wanted the recorded vote, right? Correct. So I vote yes. Okay. Sorry. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Yes. Major point. Yes. Thank you. Our next report is with regard to the 2021 budget timetable report. Ms. Whittefield, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The Council approved the 2021 budget timetable report. Is there any discussion? Councillor, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, in the report, it just reminds us all that uh, we've uh, voted in favor of 0% operating increase. So when our committees or groups that we're involved in, uh, we need to also remind them that that's our desire because it's going to be difficult to get there. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's important. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further discussion? Councillor Tadman? Thank you. Just the fact that I think uh, this is going to be good and we're going to get things out early so that we can get our tenders out and get all the things that we need done done. So we should all post this somewhere close by. Well, I'm going to take the numbers and put them right into my calendar. <laughs> well, I like something visual right on my fridge. Yeah, that is certainly the intention is to get the budget done early so we can get those tenders out sooner rather than later, which of course is always our intention, but uh, um, flooding and COVID seem to get in our way. So is there any further discussion on the motion? Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, I, even though the Deputy Mayor through your chair, she said that we went for zero, but after I read the document, one of the things that we have to do, one of the, we have to buy a new piece of equipment, which is a snow plow, which will add in above zero. That, that's likely part of the, it would be likely part of the capital budget. Yeah, not operating. Okay. Anything further? 
All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Our next report is with regard to street naming bylaw Lakehurst subdivision. Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Uh, nothing more to add, Mayor. Just uh, one thing in the bottom of the bylaw should read September 21st, not September 14th. Thank you. So should we, oh, we'll, we'll be passing the bylaw to another uh, later on in the meeting. Okay. I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman that staff that the staff report dated September 21st, 2020 from the Director of Planning and Development regarding naming of streets in the Lakehurst subdivision be received. That council passed the street naming bylaw provided in attachment number one to this report in order to declare as shown as attachment number two, street A to be named Rabbit Run and to declare street B to be named Turtle Court. And that the municipal solicitor be directed to register in the land of titles office the past bylaw at an appropriate time when the approved subdivision is finally registered. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Our next report is with regard to an application to stop up and close and transfer a road allowance. Um, uh, Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Uh, Mayor, just to highlight a couple of points in the bylaw itself and the... Uh, Mr. Walsh, could you draw your microphone closer to you, please? Just a couple of points in the bylaw itself. Thank you. Uh, in the um, third last paragraph, the legal description uh, part three, et cetera, should be reconciled with the title. The title is the correct legal description. And in the second last paragraph that starts with and or as and refers to uh, being published, uh, that should be removed since this is a technical amendment only. So we'll, we'll cover that when we get to pa the passage of the bylaws later in the meeting as well. Thank you very much. Councillor Bateman has moves and it's seconded by Councillor Anderson that Council receive the report dated September 21st, 2020 regarding application for stopping up closure and transfer of road allowance 2439 County Road 30. The Council enact a bylaw to stop up and close a portion of the road allowance adjacent to the subject property being part eight of registered reference plan 38R 3554 and that the municipal solicitor be instructed to withhold hold the actual completion of the property transfer until a deposit is first received in the amount of $1,000 to address legal registration costs in the form of a certified check. And the municipal solicitor is satisfied with the legal description of the adjoining lands to ensure merger with the same. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Next report is with regard to the revised, revised, revised parking control bylaw prohibiting parking Presque Hill Parkway from Ontario Street to the Provincial Park entrance and Huff Road south of Lakeshore Road. Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Nothing further to add, Mayor. Thank you very much. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman that Council receive the Director's report regarding prohibiting parking along select roadway segments and that the bylaw enacted by Council on August 6th be revised to remove its temporary status and be enacted as revised. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Our next report is with regard to the Bond Road Allowance, Aggregate Extraction, Votor Votorantum, CBM Aggregates, Request for Release. And although it says Mr. Ty on here, Mr. Walsh, I'll ask if you have anything to add or highlight with regard to this report. Are you Mayor, I might defer to um, Manager of Infrastructure, Scott Poole. He has the, the background on this one. Thank you very much. Mr. Poole. Nothing further, Your Worship. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Council LeBlanc, second by Council Rowley, that Council receives the report regarding the bond road allowance aggregate extraction, 
request for release as prepared by the municipal planning consultant and the council authorized the chief administrative officer to sign the release document as requested by St. Mary Cement Incorporated. Is there any discussion? Although, go ahead, Councillor LeBlanc. Uh, through you to Mr. Walsh. Uh, when this first came up in front of council uh, a year, almost a year and a half ago, uh, this road, Bond Road, used to be connected through the gravel pit to White's Road, and they used to do the plowing. That way, so the, plow, the plow didn't have to turn around. I noticed here that the road ends. And I attended a meeting at uh, Sharp Street where this would go, this road, Bond Road, would eventually be connected to White's Road through the old way. Is this to satisfy the Ministry of Environment and the Natural Resources as for the final graded plan, then it can be amended if a developer wants to, to go to White's Road. Do you want me to take that to Mr. Poole? Please. Mr. Poole? Uh, this, this motion is strictly to release them of their license for this uh, road allowance, the one that's currently active. Uh, I understand there was history where they drove through to the White's Road. Uh, this is unrelated to that. I, I really honestly don't know the status, whether there's any formal status of that. In the future, the developer can pursue, pursue that avenue. Currently, it's being cul-de-sac, uh, proper cul-de-sac being provided uh, about 1,000 meters or 361 meters into the pit cul-de-sacs, but I think they're considering going off. There's a pond there. They want to develop further the property uh, and may, may connect to White's Road to be determined. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, go ahead, Councilor Tadman. Is it, um, I haven't been out there, uh, and I don't think I'm really allowed yet to go in there, but, but how advanced are they now to remediate that after the pit is being closed. Mr. Poole? I believe they're in the final strokes of satisfying their, their license so they can be released of uh, their obligations. So they're near the end and this is the final final straw as, well, as I've been told. So it's basically remediated to, to MOE's stats then at this point? Yes, m and R's. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, are we allowed to go in sometime? Not, I don't mean tomorrow, but can we see what it looks like now that the gravel's all out of it? Some, sometime around February 29th or March 1st, uh, the, the um, pit company, and I see a representative here, uh, was offering to take counsel into the new and old pits uh, on a tour, right. and then of course um, two weeks later the pandemic hit so we sort of punted all that into a later date um, Mike uh, if it's okay with council I'm going to ask Mike a question and would you be comfortable with um, allowing us into the pit or t or, or at least um, touring us into the pit at some point please do if that's okay with council sure Thank you. So just to, to, to your first question about the rehabilitation of the site, the rehabilitation is complete. Um, we're at the point now where we're ready to surrender the license, but this is something that has to happen before the license can be surrendered. Um, so we've met our, our site plan obligations. Um, we've gone through, we've double checked everything. Um, it's according to final rehab plans. So we're at that point. So if you're, if you want to come out and have a look or if anybody in council wants to come see it, um, I'd be more than happy to meet you there. Um, we could go for a walk, take a look. So, yeah. If, if that's of interest, what we can do is call a, a special meeting of council for a, for a site visit, if that's of interest to members of council. Council LeBlanc? Question. In the rehabilitation plan, there was supposed to be like 4,000 cubic meters of gravel, a gravel, sand, and stuff uh, into this, in this plan to be given to the town. Was that accomplished? Yes, it was. I think it was finished. I think the last of it came out middle of August. Thank you. Councillor Tadman? I certainly would like to do that. And I, we did that before, didn't we, the, at the last council? We, we went out to the Cod I think we went to the Codrington one, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think the new councillors would really enjoy seeing that. And just um, to whoever, I would just like to say 
how neat and well kept that is out at Codrington. I usually go out, I used to go every Tuesday for breakfast at Codrington, but now I go out on Sundays, and it always looks really nice, and it's a credit to your company. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Thank you. Thank you. So, Madam Clerk, we'll arrange for a special meeting at some point in the next, before the snow flies. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Is there any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Our next report is with regard to uh, uh, information from the Harbor Point Pond survey results. Mr. Poole, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Yes, I do, Your Worship. Um, considering the, uh, the acrimonious and emotional response that this, this uh, process has, has uh, elicited, um, I think there's a few points of clarification and a few corrections in the, in the report I'd like to highlight. Um, so under recommendation, so basically we're, we're looking for council, council's direction uh, as to the concept or principle, you know, uh, the next steps would be, you know, detailed design uh, or non-design and costing thereof. Um, I think core to kind of the background and purpose of this whole uh, process is that with the expansion of the Harbor Point Pond and it was expanded con uh, considerably, three quarters of the pond was uh, reconstructed, enlarged, and um, so with that, uh, staff recognized the uh, the opportunity to explore all opportunities that would improve the ecology and the water benefits of the facility as, as per the stormwater master plan, but also contribute to the social and recreational benefits of the property to the greater community. Um, however, we felt that uh, any modifications to the use of the facility uh, or, and any potential significant investment of public funds would require meaningful public consultation with the residents around the pond, as well as the greater community. Uh, we were looking for a true, truly democratic process, uh, asking for, you know, what do you want to see in this facility? Uh, so we looked for guidance from the, the, uh, the stormwater master plan, the uh, provincial uh, planning and design manual, from the MO, MECP, um, and uh, from that, uh, you know, the from the stormwater master plan, they highlighted the objectives of, or the need for vegetation enhancements uh, to prevent further shoreline erosion, uh, the need to delineate the pond boundary, and effectively deter nuisance waterfowl. Um, Stormwater Master Plan also talked considerably about fencing, uh, which I've uh, included an excerpt from the from the report, where they talk about fencing under certain conditions, uh, including living fencing. Uh, and just of note, uh, about 50% of the pond is currently fenced, and or there's a cedar, you know, dense cedar hedge or bush alongside it. Uh, the, we also looked heavily at the stormwater um, management planning design manual, which provides provincial planning and design guidelines, um, where they, they rely on natural plant species surrounding the stormwater pond to improve water quality, stabilize slopes, deter waterfowl, and encourage safety by uh, discouraging people from going to the water. Um, we also looked at the official plan policies related to to the stormwater pond. Um, the property is designated community facility, um, and there is uh, some policies in the plan 
regarding this, uh, including parks and recreation. Uh, the municipality is to promote a healthy, active community by providing a full range of equi equitably dis distribu excuse me, an equitable distribution of publicly accessible uh, natural settings for recreation, including parklands, open space, trails, and where practical, water-based resources. Um, and we, we consider this uh, a developing and underserviced area in terms of green space and recreational facilities. Um, and uh, the community facility uh, allows for these kind of developments and including um, you know parks you know a community facility will allow arenas uh, fire halls etc so there's a lot of uses you can do of a community facility um, so f further to our presentation at council uh, on the uh, July 20th, uh, we've completed the inf information and engagement process to solicit input from ratepayers. Um, this process was considered a, a first phase, and that subsequent to that, uh, and depending on council direction, we would look at either further consultation or, or final design. Um, our engagement process included a circular and a question, uh, circulation of a questionnaire and concept plan. The the what we would normally have done was gone to a public meeting, which would have been a, a lot easier and more and more cost effective. But in uh, since that wasn't an option during COVID, um, it was decided to go to a uh, a mail circulation of of a concept plan and, and questionnaire as well as a uh, web web notice with a web form for for people to respond to it um, it was issued uh, July 28th uh, original deadline was August 6th but due to some printing malfunctions and delays related to covid and and the mail the response the response was in, uh, was extended to September 4th, and we've been taking uh, and fielding comments up until the 16th of September. Uh, there has been some inquiries about the cost of the survey. Uh, I've uh, dug out what they were. Uh, they included postage, about $4,500, printing, $1,500, envelopes, $500, so a total of about $6,400. Now that would be billed to a COVID account for which there's provincial funding for. That's expense we would not have occurred except for COVID that would have been handled through a public meeting. Uh, we also had staff time estimated at 40 hours in, in preparing the plan and the questionnaire uh, mail, mailing and data an analysis. Um, there was approximately 100 surveys not delivered due to a slightly malfunctioning stuffing machine and uh, and some address issues uh, that uh, COVID kind of exa exacerbated. So survey results, there was 223 responses. I had my original, in, originally in my report, I had 250, that was, that was an error. Um, there was 5,200 sent out. And so the, the response was approximately 4%. Um, not a great response, but not, not, un, not un, uh, uncommon. Uh, okay, so so the results have been provided in uh, in one of the attachments, um, and it's broken down into several distributions, um, analyzed statistically. 
uh, total responses on the first page which uh, show a uh, significant preference for a path around the pond at 67%. So the path, uh, would you like a path around the pond? Uh, of the total responses, 67% did, 30%, 33% didn't. Uh, the question, would you like to see the Harbour Point Pond fenced? 33% said yes, 67% said no. And uh, the other question, how would you like to see that fencing occur? You know, either between public and private lands or between, uh, or at the top of the pond, basically, Tom, ba Tom Bank. So 85% said if there was fencing, they'd want to see it around the properties between the pri private and public property. 15% adjacent the pond. So. Uh, second page, that's the response directly to the pa from the owners around the pond, of which there is 32 that front on the pond. The, the, we made sure that all the owners around the pond had received a, a survey, and the results showed uh, that the pond, you know, 30% wanted it, or sorry, the pathway, 30% wanted it, 68% didn't want it. Uh, again, you can see, would you like to see the fence? No resounding. Um, and probably where the fence is concerned is somewhat irrelevant. So, um, again, this, this result was probably somewhat skewed by the fact that about 50% of the pond is fenced currently. Um, so we, we then looked at uh, breaking it up and seeing what the, it affected and how it affected the neighborhood, what the level of interest was for people walking within a walking distance of it. So we had a five minute walk from the Harbor Point Pond, which showed 58% wanted a pathway, 42% didn't. And then the fence, again, you know, nobody seemed to be interested in the fencing. Uh, then we went to 1,000 meters, so a 10 minute walk. 64% indicated they'd like to see a path. 36% didn't want to see a path. So just as a clarification, so the 500 meter and the 1,000 meters the people directly around and bordering the pond were included in those two distances. So there is a decided interest around the pond area. So there is a communal benefit there. You know, we saw common concerns, uh, obviously geese are an issue uh, vermin, snakes, um, but I guess our, our biggest concern was the uh, was grass cutting. Um, the municipal staff has cut grass in the past along the upper areas of the pond, I am, I'm told. Uh, I think in the interest of controlling noxious weeds and vermin. Um, however, residents are continuing have and continue to cut their property or cut the property right down to the pond banks including cutting down the cattails and pond vegetation at the edge of the pond. Um, stormwater ponds are designed to have naturalized vegetation around them. No matter what stormwater report you're reading they recommend that you maintain the banks in natural vegetation, you enhance the, the banks with natural vegetation, trees, shrubs, grasses, you shade the water, you improve water quality, uh, you stabilize the slopes, uh, you, disturb, you discourage public access to the water's edge, and you deter geese and waterfowl. Geese do not like 
heavy growth on banks. So it is a natural deterrent. And last but certainly not least is just increasing biodiversity and, and wildlife habit, habitat. I think that really should be a big, a big thing in our, in our stewardship in this in this town. We strip a lot of trees and we build a lot of sidewalks. We have to improve our environment. Uh, the Brighton Stormwater Master Plan recommended certain mowing patterns. You know, confirming what we've just discussed. Um, and next on the report, uh, there's been also some questions about current pond maintenance practices around town. Uh, we have seven or eight ponds. Uh, I've listed them here with uh, whether they have pathways, fences, what the current maintenance practices are, and any, any comments about them. So as you can see, there there's a fair, fair diversity in what's being done around town. Uh, not a lot of fencing. The only fencing is Tacky Barrier Ridge and that was largely due to the steepness of the banks uh, being three to one. Um, most of the ponds uh, have heavy vegetation around their banks. Um, our, uh, Brighton by the Bay, they do mow the upland area. Uh, they are mowing down the banks a little farther than desired and we're having discussions with them about that now. Uh, Ruse subdivision pond, it's left natural. Uh, Lucas, the banks are all left natural, heavy dense growth along the banks. Uh, the upper parts above the banks are are cut by the uh, neighboring properties. Um, Orchard Gate, it's left fairly natural. Residents do cut paths through through the pond area. There, there is a gentleman that mows it to keep it accessible. Uh, Tackerberry Ridge, uh, mostly left uh, natural vegetation. Same with Forest Hill. Um, so we, we presented uh, a couple options in consideration of the, uh, the emotional and uh, acrimonious comments and responses we've gotten. Uh, we presented a couple different alternatives for Council's consideration and, and put some costs to them. Um, <coughs> Okay, option one is kind of enhanced development, increasing amenities to service the needs of a wider community, uh, aligning with the municipality's strategic plan, including landscape enhancements and construction of a pedestrian pond. Um, now, this this pathway that we're suggesting is is a is a passive use pathway. We're not; it's not a destination site. We expect it to be used by the local neighborhood, walking around the neighborhood. Um, option two, a more limited development of the Harbor Point, to meet, Harbor Point Pond to meet MOECP regulations and accepted manu uh, stormwater management principles by encouraging naturalization of the facility. So regardless of either option, we believe that the banks should be naturalized. We, we, to do proper land stewardship, we should be providing, enhancing that, that uh, vegetation. Um, to, so there's further breakdown of option one and two and some of the, uh, the uh, capital and maintenance operations. Uh, some common capital maintenance, maintenance uh, excuse me, maintenance requirements, uh, so legis legal legislation, um, both options two, one and two comply with MECP uh, environmental compliance approval. 
Um, financial implications. Uh, so we have provided some cost estimates for capital improvements. So option number one, uh, some site grading, path construction, enhanced tree and shrub plantings, site restoration, and site ac access control like gates and bollards, uh, estimated at 32,000. Um, now these, these investments you know, could be phased over an extended period of time uh, based on budget limitations. Uh, this is also in consideration that the developer is responsible for, ad, for an additional, you know, I had a, a typo here, $10,000 uh, for plantings as part of their subdivision agreement. I had 5000 in there, but that should be $10,000. Um, uh, so there'll be some additional operating costs associated with the pathway, uh, pathway repairs, bio enforcement, litter pickup. Uh, additional work can be implemented by municipal forces. Uh, we threw a number at it uh, on a yearly basis, $5,200. Uh, so option two, limited development. Uh, capital investment is fairly limited. Uh, still suggesting we enha enhance the uh, the plantings, investing probably $5,000 in addition to the $10,000 that the developer is on the hook for. Um, operation costs would not uh, increase significantly compared to expenditures. Um, sort of in conclusion, um, we believe it's the obligation of the municipality to uh, sort of in, in conformance with uh, our municipal planning documents, i.e. the official plan, the strategic plan, and the stormwater master drainage plan, as well as provincial guidelines and regulations uh, to, to enhance and provide the maximum benefits from their existing municipal facility. Of course, giving consideration to existing property owner concerns. Uh, the incorporation of trails and recreational facility, uh, facilities are very common in an accepted uh, practice in Ontario. We're not stepping outside the box here. Uh, we think it is in the best interest of, of the community based on the numbers we receive, based on conventional planning processes. And that just brings my report to an end. Thank you, Mr. Poole. So I'm going to ask if there are, is anyone present who wishes, don't get up yet, you're just going to raise your hand, uh, who wishes to make comment, okay. Pardon? Can I comment at this point? Or? Uh, no, I'd like the public to comment first, so we'll suspend the bylaw and then we'll get counsel. Okay, go ahead. We offered the opportunity for people to speak either before or now. I don't think we've been through this so many times. I don't want us opening up to people who have already spoken. If there's people who have not spoken yet, I'm willing to agree to that. I'm just, we're going to go on for hours about this. If, if we suspend the bylaw, we really have no choice but to offer comment to anybody, though. That's, that's the concern. So I'm going to read the motion and council can decide and council rally is the mover and I will need a seconder that council suspend the procedural bylaw to allow for public comments regarding 9.8 staff report results of Harbor Point Pond proposed development plan public survey and before I get a seconder council rally can I ask that we add uh, to allow for public comments of no more than two minutes. Thank you. So it's moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council suspend the procedural bylaw to allow for public comments of no more than two minutes per person. You okay with that? Adding per person. Regarding 9.8 staff report results of Harbour Point Pond proposed development plan public survey. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. So if you have not yet made comment in citizens comment or delegations this evening, please step forward.
And I'll just ask you to uh, provide us with your name. For My the name record. is Robin McFarlane. Thank you, Robin. Go ahead. I live at 130 Cedar Street. Um, my property backs on to the pond as well. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for giving this opportunity to speak. So this development proposal has uh, given us an opportunity to share something that could be really awesome with the rest of Brighton, something that could become beautiful. Um, it goes beyond my backyard. It goes beyond my community, and we can see that from the results. It's not just about the people who live surrounding the pond. As we go further and further, as we reach our community, more and more people see how awesome this could be. Um, I mean, personally, I'd be honored <laughs> to host Brighton in my backyard. Um, I trust the people of my community um, to enjoy the space respectfully. The amount of people who will benefit from this um, will go beyond the people who live there now. It'll be for the people who live there uh, 20 years from now even, and we can't make that decision now for the rest of, for whoever's gonna be around for it. Um, so I want this for for Brighton because I want people to have a safe space to walk within our community. Um, currently, I take my two young children along Cedar Street, the street that we live on, and it's dangerous. People are going really fast down there. The sidewalk slopes the wrong way. And if I could jump out into my backyard and have a nice quick walk around that pond on a manicured path, it would be awesome. It would be amazing for elderly people, people with disabilities, and anybody else in the community who wants to enjoy it. So, yeah, I'd just like to say it's not about me. It's not about the people who live directly around the pond. It's about all of Brighton being able to enjoy a community space. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Green? Uh, thank you for the record, David Green. Uh, this is a stormwater management pond. It has a purpose. It is not appropriate to have it open to the public. We are aware and we can all remember of the two deaths that were caused uh, by water rushing through a stormwater pond when people were in it. And I believe that the pond should be kept as a pond to manage the water and not be open to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Is there anyone else in the public who has not yet had a chance to speak to the subject? There you go. <laughs> I, I feel this is a bit of a loophole, Mr. Richardson, but you go ahead. <laughs> William Richardson, 104 Raglan. Not wasn't prepared to speak, but in uh, response to what Mr. Poole had to say, I'd like to go back a, about a year and a half before the uh, pond had, was uh, the way it was before. We had a pair of mating swans would come in February and wait there till the end of uh, May, take off. When the swans were there, we didn't have that much geese. We had maybe a dozen, because the swans kept the geese away. Because there was lots of vegetation for the swans to build their nest. So now, the, fast forward, the pond has been expanded. The growth hasn't started yet. Or it's beginning to start coming in now at the edges of the pond. So that should bring back the swans next year, hopefully, which should deal with the problems we have right now with the geese. Now my wife has been uh, in constant touch with E.O. Ward, the engineer from E.O. Ward and Van Meer, who uh, were involved with the, uh, enlarging the pond, the new pond. And uh, both say we should have the natural vegetation around the pond, and they encourage that, not a fence. And even the a e MOE or E have stated that it's, the natural vegetation is better around the pond than a fence. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Okay. Is there anyone else who has not had an opportunity to speak? I, I will come back to those who have had an opportunity to speak, if you want to reiterate. But I'm a relative newcomer to, to the pond. And your name, ma'am? I came here three years ago. And your name? Joan Gregson. Thank you, Joan. Go ahead. 
When I bought the when I bought we bought I bought the house, and looking at the back, I thought it's so beautiful, all the green grass across the pond, and all the wildlife that we I could see coming and going. And that place did not need sidewalks or fences; it just need natural beauty, and that's what it has. It needs some upkeep to get rid of the weeds, but that's about it because it's a thing of beauty, and why should we destroy it with sidewalks and fences? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has not had an opportunity to speak with regard to this subject? Okay, so those who have had an opportunity to speak, if you have something new to introduce, please step forward. Mrs. Richardson. Mine is uh, pretty much of a question, and I'm hoping that Mr. Poole could explain designated community facility. I had the, the original paperwork for the pond when it was put in in 2004 by Mr. Wallace. I have the stormwater management plan when it was enlarged. I have a copy of the stormwater management plan that EOR did. I have paperwork coming out of the yin yang. I have never ever heard of this called a community facility. I've had David Fisher come to the, to the defend, to the detention pond. I spoke to Toronto. Nobody has ever called this a community facility. As a matter of fact, the people that signed the ECA for the enlargement of this pond, in their email to me, they have no previous paperwork until Toby Development applied for an ECA. This pond was never assumed by the town like the previous ponds. Mrs. Where Richardson, did this designated Mrs. community can we facility? Lower the, just lower the volume. Like. Could you answer that for me, please? Is that a zoning or under the OP? Yes, it's, it's an official plan designation. Uh, Paul can probably. Pardon? Uh, it's an official plan designation. By who? The By Brighton's the... official plan. It's on the mapping of the official plan. Mr. Walsh, can you confirm that? Yes, Mayor, I can confirm that it's, um, I know it's zoned a community facility zone. Uh, it is also zoned community facility? Yeah. Thank you. As of what year? Do you know? As in uh, December 2nd, 2019. Also, um, I would hope that uh, Mr. Poole would review EOR's storm water management plan and the MOA regulations in regards to grass cutting. I am well aware of the grass cutting. And they both state, especially at the MOE, that you are to take into the aesthetics of the surrounding properties. And EUR has stated in their stormwater management plan as well that stakeholder involvement. And in the comments, in their, in their report approved by this council, clearly states more stakeholders and that if, if a permanent, any kind of permanent fence was to be put up, preferably the, um, vegetation fence. I personally spoke to Sue Sampson, as most of you know in my emails. She was responsible. She designed the enlargement of this pond. This pond was designed on the enhancement of the original design of the pond. When I spoke to her, she felt she didn't need, she thought that she didn't need to add that, that everybody would understand that. It is designed not to have a fencing. It is too expensive and it will interfere with maintenance. And I do have another question. Could you please tell me where the bulrushes were cut down around the Harbor Point uh, stormwater pond? I, I didn't hear the question. Could you had mentioned that there that res, there there had been some bulrushes cut? Could you tell me where? All the vegetation around the, the south end of the pond has been cut to the to the water level. Not all of it, because I had submitted some pictures too. We're not no. going to get into a debate. No, I know. Is, uh, you had mentioned earlier to uh, uh, quite a few months ago to a stakeholder that you had held back some money from the contractor in regards to the grass, where all the ditches are, like the trenches and everything from the flooding, because the grass has never grown properly. Is that going to be taken care of? Yes, and they're, they're probably starting this week as part of their, their maintenance requirements for their subdivision and the subdivision agreement, they are required to, re to repair the scars and reseed areas that aren't growing in. 
Could you please tell me who is okay, responsible? Okay, Mrs. Richardson. Just one more quick question, thank you. No, I'm going to go to Mrs. Rickman. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to have another speech. <laughs> My husband cut that land around the so-called pond, the water retention area, for eight plus years at the expense of us. We bought a riding lawnmower to cut around it. Mrs. That was Mrs. Rickman, can we just lo Sorry. lower the volume and temperature? Thank you. At our expense, we bought a riding lawnmower. That was supposed to be town property to be maintained and looked after. It never was. Now all of a sudden that it is, and now you're wanting to put a walkway, and you know what? Has nothing to do with us. We don't have a say. Yeah, we had a bit of a say, but not enough as far as I'm concerned. What happens if somebody walks along the walkway that you guys are thinking of putting in and flicks a match into my cedar hedge? As well as Mrs. Gregson's, who lives next door to me. What happens then? Whose liability? Because you've allowed people to walk around the pond, the cedar, around the pond or the water retention area. And a flick of a, you know what, right now, somebody walks out there, it's usually any of us, we don't open it up to come on in and check out this and flick your cigarette butt along our cedar hedge. If it goes up, there's going to be some real unhappy people. And like I said at the beginning, we didn't purchase our land or build our house there to have outsiders come in and walk around our back area. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rickman. Is there anyone else who... Hang on, everyone. Don't, don't rush the microphone. <laughs> so... Again, it's about the people that will be accessing the, the facility if, if, if it goes through. How will you know who comes in? Are you going to have someone sit there and ask, where are you from? Because you can't stop teenagers and you can't stop people that want to cause any kind of crime from coming into the park. So who, who's going to maintain that area? I would suggest that the same people who maintain any of our other public facilities, if we were to go ahead, nobody. It's, it would be open to the public. Okay, so who's who's going to have a look to see who's coming and who's going? No, no one. Nobody. It's no a, one. We, we, exactly. It so it's facility. open to anyone, but I believe Mr. Poole said it, it's going to be mainly used by the people who live within the area of the pond. Right. No, you can't say that because you don't know who's going to come in there. Anyone can walk in at any time. So if, And if you lived around the pond, you'd be concerned. Especially if you're a widow, you'll be damn concerned at who's coming around the pond and what time of day. Please you don't want people coming through and, watch, and looking through your windows. We had a peeping Tom in our neighborhood, so is this an invitation for him to come back? Think about it. Thank you. Stryden. I just want to support this lady that spoke up about cutting the grass, her husband, on his um, lawnmower. My husband also purchased a riding lawnmower. We, for several years, because the town was negligent in looking after that property, my husband and her husband and one other man cut all that property for years. It's only been in the last few years that the town took responsibility and started cutting it. And as far as somebody wanting to walk through there with their children, it's an impossibility with 140 geese pooping all over it. You can't walk two steps without walking into goose poop. So welcome to my life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Langevin. Um, I just, oops, sorry. 
Uh, Cheryl Longevin, uh, Cove Crescent. I just have one question. About three years ago, I spoke with Steve Ashton when he was here, our planner, and Mr. Miller, about why the $500 in lieu of parkland. This really infuriates me. When you go to other areas and they they oblige, the contractors are obliged, developers, to put parkland within their subdivisions. If we had small green, I don't, it doesn't have to be a park with swings, but green space within every one of our subdivisions, we wouldn't have to be taking over a stormwater facility as park space because people would have it within their own environment. They could walk there, the children could play, there wouldn't none of this business going up and down Cedar Street. Um, and there is a small park off Raglan. So I, I question that as to why it's so necessary to take $500 in lieu of. I mean, are we really that desperate for money when we're really wanting to make our community safe for people? A lot of people walk, they can stop in that park, meet their neighbors, um, et cetera. Of course, you have to have a poop and scoop law too because they take the dogs in there. The other thing, I, question I want to ask is, the 5,200 homeowners or ratepayers that received the um, survey, was that the entire Brighton municipality? Yes. It was? And you only received 223 responses? That, that's correct. Yeah. So I go back to the fact that here we have 4% of the population making decisions for 96% of the population, the other 96, to increase their taxes, to create a recreational facility around a working stormwater facility. Are they going to be very happy when they see that their taxes have escalated for a few people to walk around to have a nice little park made around a working facility? And just to be clear, it's significantly less than 4% that will be making the decision because it's the seven of us. That's right, it is, but I kept it 4% because that was what in the report. Okay, thank thank you. you. Mr. Langevin, don't forget to put your masks on when you're wandering around the community center, please. I've lived around that pond for 15 years, and I'm one of the people that cuts the grass down on the municipal lawn because nobody does it. It was full of vermin, rats, and many other different things. I also trimmed the hedge because the municipality never trimmed it. And there were a lot of other people doing the same thing because the, that area was being neglected. I, over those 15 years, I've never seen anybody cut down a bulrush. What we have in there is an invasive species, which is the pampas grass. I cut that down because you know why? It was growing up into my lawn and would have been up by my deck because there was no maintenance of that pond. And by the way, Mr. Poole, it's growing again. It's grown out into the pool. It's, come, it's grown into the lawns. I have a question for Jim. Jim. Do you have the staff and money to maintain that pond with all that shrubs, all those trees, all that grass getting? Now be honest, tell me. You don't have, to, you don't have the capability to do it now. Thank Mr. Mr. Longevin, we're not here to grill staff. Thank you. We were allowed to ask questions, and yes. I'm asking a question ask of it, Jim. You ask it to me. Okay, I'll ask you, Mr. Mayor. Do you have enough? staff for Jim to maintain that pond in the condition that we see in the picture. Thank you. Thank you. And the answer would be today, no. Uh, we would have to have a budget for that, and that would be part of the 2021 budget if we move this project forward. Anyone else who has not, or has or has not had a chance to speak? All right. So I have a motion moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley, and we will need to amend this motion because it, uh, it is not uh, where we need to go. The Council receives this report regarding the results of the Harbour Point Development Public Survey as information, and the Council provide direction on how they would like to proceed with the development of the Harbour Point Stormwater Facility. So, Councillors LeBlanc, LeBlanc and Rowley, 
I will be striking the second line and putting in whatever direction your motion would like to move forward with. If you're going to be that close to each other, please wear your masks. Councillors Rowley and LeBlanc, if you're going to be that close to each other, please wear your masks. Okay. Yeah, take, take a second or two. Hey, Doug. Doug, Councillor LeBlanc, shut your mic off, please. Thank you. Are you ready? How would you like it to read? I'd like you to read that this, the harbor, this, this project is dead right now on the floor. It doesn't proceed any further. We do nothing. We do nothing. We don't, we don't put grass in at the... We put the grass, but no, no walkway. Okay, so option, option two. Option two, yes. Uh, for staff's purposes, if we say directs to proceed with option two in the report, is that sufficient? I, I guess, Your Worship, if I could get some more direction with regard to uh, vegetation and plantings on the pond banks and the maintenance thereof and regulation thereof. Is that not listed in option two? So option two says landscape improvements such as seed establishment and tree planting maintenance operations, reduce grass cutting and litter pickup, grass cutting and litter pickup, regular maintenance of the pond and inlet, bollards at the gate, Enhanced signage and bylaw enforcement to eliminate cutting by residents of, of the pond slope and control of noxious weeds. The, the, the CAO is telling me he feels that that's clear. Councillor LeBlanc? Also, through you, your, uh, Mayor, in the training session, it also said that we would come and we would keep it at eight inches up to the high water mark plus three meters so that nothing would go above. That was given at the training session. And then from there it would be kept as normally cutting. Understood. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? Is that motion now on the floor? We can ask It is, question? yeah. Okay. That's why I'm asking for discussion. <laughs> so making sure. I haven't been able to talk yet. Um, I just want to say I'm disappointed in this whole process right from the beginning and I'm not going to I'm just tired of the, the anger and the hatred, and we haven't even made a decision. We've been threatened. We get emails. We get phone calls. Anyway, let's, I'm so glad to see us being able to make a decision on this tonight. Uh, I agree with option two. I want to see um, um, things maintained in the proper way around this pond and every pond, and I want to see us doing it the same around every pond. Um, if we need to let the, the vegetation grow longer in order to prevent... Um, a geese or whatever it is that we need to do, I want to see that happen. And uh, I think I think you listed everything that I had written down here as far as um, maintenance. Um, I'm just reading for a minute. And just, it, you know, if we're able to d deter the geese, obviously we don't control the geese, but uh, they are a real deterrent and they do make a big mess. So if we're able to control that in any way possible, that would be great as well. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Council Rowley? I think, uh, I think Deputy Mayor took uh, most of my comments, so I'm good with that. I just want a little clarification, too. The entrance off Beacon, um, I'm guessing that's where the, um, some kind of a gate will be then, is that's so that it would be just accessible by municipal staff. And what will that look like? Will that stay a graveled um, access point, or will that be regressed? Option two says bollards, just for your information, so not a gate, Sp not specifically a gate. And Mr. Poole has an answer to question two, I think. Our, our recent discussions with uh, neighboring homeowners and in staff is that the bollards would likely, and a gate would likely go back right by the pond away from the road, that the access area would be totally grassed, so that when you're driving by, it appears like lawn. Thank you. Councillor Bateman. 
I was writing fast and furious. I had a ton of questions, and most of them have been answered, believe it or not. But I do have some, a, a couple questions and one statement, if, if I'm allowed. It, it, it's, we've been hearing all the different priorities and what the major issues are, but from all the people that I spoke to, and the resounding thing, I think you can bubble up privacy to the top. And I'm not sure, and I don't know, I think it needs to be made public. I, there is a privacy issue around that pond currently. I know in March of 2020, the OPP confiscated a camera that was found in a tree that was trained on two houses around the pond, and it's in the hands of a detective in Northumberland. The camera was discovered in April of 2019, and they finally picked it up in March of 2020. Whether it's tied to the well-documented case from somebody within the area, but somebody might want to reach out to them to see at some point, nobody's heard anything since. That was relayed to me from a resident. I had never heard about it until I started touching base with people. So I, got, I can understand people's privacy concerns, especially if you go back in history with, you know, Mr. Williams from CFB Trenton. That impacted our community as well. The question is, I did have some. Okay. Oh, the other statement I want to make, somebody had mentioned, I think it was Mr. Poole, that X number of lots are fenced, and I do agree with that, but as we heard tonight, that was at the expense of the residents due to the, to the geese, so I think we have to take that into consideration. I'm, I was leaning towards option two because I don't believe it should be a walking trail. Mr. Toby, Toby Developments, has already said there's going to be a trail in Hamilton Woods. For the resident that was looking for places to walk, I think we do... We need to do a better job of advertising the parks we have. A lot of people don't know there is one off of Raglan, but there is also one off of Cedar Street for that purpose. The question I would have is, uh, this being a stormwater facility first and foremost, and if we go with option two to plant the vegetation, when would that take place? Because this is being new. We haven't experienced anything like we have in 2017, or again, to a lesser extent, but still bad as in 2019. Would we be waiting to see that this thing is functioning as it's supposed to function before we start planting or doing anything around that? I, I would pose that to Mr. Poole. Mr. Poole. I think um, it'll take us a little bit of time to put together the final plan of how the plantings will actually occur. There is money there, as I said, from the developer's contribution that we could start with if we don't have any other budgeted monies. Uh, otherwise, you know, we could shift it to the spring planting season, uh, budget for additional work. Um, my preference would be to make some improvements this fall, uh, very soon, get the weeds down, get something growing properly, but, you know, time's running out. Back to you. Yeah, no, I, I guess my question is who, who's going to make the determination if we plant stuff where it should be planted because I, I would assume that would have to be like an engineer and make sure everything's in the right spot because you wouldn't want anything that would impede you for going in there and doing what that, like if you have to do repairs and all the other stuff, like you really don't want to. We talk about cutting around trees. I'm thinking more in terms of not impeding your maintenance, maintenance of the pond. The decision for what's planted where will be made by staff? Staff can do it. We have uh, a lady who is uh, very, has a very good landscape background. And, on staff. Uh, on staff. On staff, yes. Yep. Yeah. And we've got considerable experience in stormwater on design. Thank you. Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, going back to earlier in the evening, I, I wanted to make a point that when we receive something, it dies. Uh, this didn't die when the rest, I voted against this because I thought it was such a ridiculous idea right from the start. Couldn't figure out why staff went ahead with something that wasn't directed by council. And so I did vote no, and I've been firm ever since, and there's nothing nothing that could convince me that this is a good idea. We've spent a lot of money on it. I'm glad now this is done. We have given the people around that pond grief now for, what, two months or more, and I don't think it's fair in any way. But I also want to say 
uh, Mr. Poole said that it was because of COVID that we did the survey. I, excuse me for saying it, I am sick and tired of excuses with COVID. This didn't have to be done at all. And I've talked to people in the rural area too, plus in the urban, they don't even know what a stormwater management plant is to begin with. I wouldn't have known if I wasn't on council. So how are they making a decision to do with this? There's four priorities that, and I've been on council, and, and so have you, um, Mayor, since 2003 for the most part. And I, my priorities are always health and safety, accessibility, financial responsibility, and being environmentally protected. And I'm sure that's everybody around here. This encapsulates what I believe in, and none of this, none of these, uh, encapsulates what I believe we need to do, so I'm glad this is over with. I'll, I'll, hopefully, you haven't called the vote yet, sorry. I have not, but thank you. Any further discussion? Councilor Bateman. Just to follow up on what Councilor Tadman had just mentioned, I walked the pond more than one time. When I say walked the pond, you know, from the outside, so I'm talking going door to door. And I'm going to be completely honest, I did run into two people that didn't think a walking trail was a bad idea. But they quickly followed that up by saying they could not justify spending taxpayers' money when there's infrastructure needs elsewhere. But two people, as we saw with the numbers, like 4%, that, that's a very small representation of uh, the population of the money we're spending. But I did have one more question, and it's not related to the survey, it's not related to the expense, well, it is related to the expansion of the pond, and I had emailed them to the CAO, and I'm, I don't know if Mr. Castleman can answer him tonight. My one concern, because I heard multiple times, you know, here and there, when they did the expansion, the material that was taken out, because when we're talking about cost, and we have the cost of doing it, and if option one and option two have cost, the material that was taken out, was it taken to a licensed fill site so that the municipality is not going to be somewhere down the road coupled with more money that we're not prepared to spend. Mr. And if Councilman? it was taken somewhere, then so be it. You have to push the purple button. There you go. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, certainly that issue is going to be the subject of a, a formal report to Council on uh, the October 5th meeting. Any further discussion? Councillor Anderson. I'm glad everybody have a sensible solution tonight. Um, I think say, uh, I think Mary made it very clear too. Safety is the biggest issue here. Uh, uh, w and when when these are planned, they should be done when the development and, we, and it's in the report anyhow. But something like this, if it ever happens again, it's got to be in the plan from the time of development at the time of sale. So people buying a product or moving into the area can see what they're going to get. I think it's very important for the, the entire public and, and the community to, to be able to enjoy the community at its full, whatever, if it's pro town property, whatever. Uh, but in this case, I agree that this is a sort of a, a neighborhood that uh, and it's and it's 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 a, a site that needs to be protected, and it should have the natural naturalness of it. Uh, I I believe we shouldn't be cutting grass like right up to the edge of it either. And I and I think we should do something about the birds. I think that swans, if it's the answer, let's let's get on it and get it done. Let's get the contractor back to get the work done. Let's not worry about floods in the future. Let's move ahead and and. And, and fix up the site. And I'm glad somebody made a comment that it's only been in the last two or three years that this uh, municipality's been actually really spending time caring for it. Well, um, yes, that's what we're here for and that's what we're gonna do. And I think we need to get the budget uh, that we can cut the grass, that Mr. Miller doesn't have to worry about where's the, if we can cut the grass next week. Uh, that it's a it's on a on a regular basis that we take care of these things and we ins inspect it and make sure things are the way it's going to be. But I think we need to manage it. We don't need to have uh, our, our residents there running it and managing it. I think we need to manage it. That's my opinion. 
Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Poole, is providing direction under option two keeping with our stormwater master plan and um, with MECP requirements? Yes, it is, Your Worship. Thank you. Councillor LeBlanc, you had a question? Yes, I have two points, Your Honor, Your Mayor. Uh, one is because we're not going to have the vegetation this spring for the swan and what they've done in other ponds so that they keep the geese away, they put in a floating nest so the coyotes can't get to them. And we should, Mr. Poole, would you be willing to look at that? Yes, through your, your worship, yes, we'll have a look at that. My second point is the young mother that came in here and talked about she couldn't walk on Cedar Street with her children because the sidewalk was sloped, sloped the wrong way. In numerous meetings we've heard about Cedar sidewalk, um, Preston, to you, is that sidewalk due to be maintained and then widened and taken care of in the near future? So that for the safety of our mothers walking their children, or kids walking to school. And everyone else who might use the sidewalk too. Through you, your worship. <laughs> uh, it's not currently in the plan because we're looking at accessibility and deficiencies for trip hazards. And there's a couple of spots that we need to fix on Cedar Street, but overall it uh, currently is acceptable according to the minimum maintenance standards. So a discussion for another day. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion? Um, before we get to the vote, I will call the vote. Uh, I know, I know that uh, Mr. Poole, you said that these the paths like this are are generally considered around Ontario. Um, it's not really out of the box thinking, but for Brighton, it was clearly a bit too innovative. Um, and I want to thank staff for the attempt. Um, I know it didn't go over well with some in the community. But it's exactly the kind of out of the box thinking that I want to see and I think most of council wants to see from our staff. So regardless of where we end up with this decision, providing that option is important to us and providing that kind of innovation is important to us. And although some people are tired of hearing about COVID-19 and the pandemic as are the rest of us, I also wanna thank you for trying to provide a en public engagement outside our ability to hold a public consultation. I get that the survey was a bit of a misfire. There were lots of, there were lots of issues that went on from um, uh, misfires at the, at the um, inserting portion and, and everything else, but at least staff was attempting to communicate with the public and we haven't really seen that level of, of communication or those attempts in the past. And so thank you very much for that. And thank, I want all of staff to hear that we wanna continue those kinds of innovative thinking moving forward, um, regardless of what the decision may be tonight. So the motion is moved by Councillor LeBlanc and seconded by Councillor Rowley that Council receives this report regarding the results of the Harbor, Harbor Point Pond Development Public Survey as information and that Council directs staff to proceed with option two. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Bateman. Since this has been on the radar screen for many years and very contentious issue, can we have a recorded vote please? Sure. Councillor Tadman. Mary, I certainly don't d disagree that it, it is always good to have innovation, whether it's the staff here or, or, or to do with anything in life. But there has to be a direction come from council, and I don't believe there ever was one. And so therefore, um, I, I can't praise staff for doing something that I, I didn't know until July the 20th that was even in the process and the next thing you and that night we see a, this beautiful picture of what it could be in paradise around a pond. Please call the vote. Councillor Mark Bateman. Uh, yes to option two. Yes to option two. Option two is the only option on the floor. Yeah. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Councillor Ron Anderson? Just one. Well, option two, yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. 
Thank you. We move to 9.9, .9, which is added to our agenda. It's with regard to an amendment to the Brighton and District Curling Club Agreement. Uh, Mr. Mr. Castleman, I'll ask for your comments, please. Uh, re really no uh, additional comments uh, uh, associated with the report. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Mr. Castleman. Uh, really no additional comments associated with the report. We're simply trying to uh, provide some additional clarity uh, with, re with respect to an existing agreement that we have in place. Uh, we've certainly had staff input. We've had input from the uh, curling club. Everybody is in agreement that the uh, proposed uh, amendment to uh, Article 12 of the existing agreement. Everybody's happy with that. Um, the coin club has gone to the board for concurrence and I'm going to council to do just that also. Thank you, Mr. Castleman. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Rowley, that council authorize the amendment to paragraph 12 of the facility use agreement between the municipality of Brighton and the Brighton and District Curling Club, and further the Council authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute the said agreement. Is there any discussion? Council Rowley. Thank you. So that's the only amendment. There's no real um, changes in the uh, whole financial setup that we have with the, uh, with the Curling Club. Mr. Castleman. Everything else is the same. Exactly. Thank you very much. Any further questions? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. And 9.10, a verbal from the clerk's department with regard to future council meetings. Madam Clerk. It has to do with COVID and the fact that the numbers seem to be rising and we're seeing, you know, um, Ford has put in place about the social gatherings. I just want to be sure that um, council is aware that we can have our council meetings at the council chambers with council themselves we can always have no public attendance um, physically, but we can do it through virtual means through Zoom, and we can have um, delegations still, we can still have citizens' comments and question period there is just um, a process that we would have to put in place um, with the community so that they know to call in or to send in um, an email that they wish to, to still speak and register kind of the similar way here that we're doing now where people um, register to come to the meetings and um, we're able to do that through Zoom if they wish to still um, conduct it that way, not come physically, but they would like to have a delegation, we can still do it through Zoom this way as well. But I'm just planning ahead um, because of the numbers increasing. I just wanna make sure that uh, council is aware that we can still have council themselves, 10 people, in the council chambers, staff and public would have to be in by Zoom. Thank you very much. So are you looking for some direction from council with regard to how to proceed in the interim or in the near future? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I, I just, I'm gonna go around the table without asking for a motion and then I'll write the motion based on that and I'll start, Councillor Tadman, do you wanna, I guess the question is, do you wanna continue the way we're doing it now here at the community center? or would you rather have council present in council chambers and have the public um, and staff Zoom or come in via, via virtual meeting? Right. Well, as of, for, for instance, tonight, we needed more room for people to come in and um, give their opinion on what was taking place tonight. And we won't always be here because COVID's going to go away. Dr. Trump told me it was. I heard him <laughs> the other night. Wow. So we, we, it, this isn't going to happen forever. So for now, I think I would prefer to meet here as much as it's kind of cozier at the uh, council chambers, but it doesn't open it up for enough people. I don't Thank know. you. Council Rowley? I want to concur with... Uh, Councillor Tadman as for right now, but I'm sure as the weeks go on and who knows what changes were going to be made, uh, we might all be back on Zoom at some point. So uh, I'm okay with status quo for now, but uh, I'm certainly uh, willing to cooperate if things need to change based on uh, provincial regulations. Good to stay home. I prefer this to sitting at my desk watching you all on a computer. I find that much more tiring. I suspect we all do. Yeah, so yeah. this is good, but 
You know what? We're going to have to play by Doug's rules. What just, happens? just to be clear, and it's not this Doug, it's the Premier you're referring to. Um, uh, to be clear, the option on the table is what we're doing now or council meets at 35 Alice Street with everyone else zooming in. Okay, the option for now is to stay here. Thank okay. you. Councillor Bateman. I'm comfortable with staying here to the point that I don't find these chairs comfortable, but I'm comfortable in every other aspect. I hear that, brother. Councillor LeBlanc. I agree with the other okay. three councillors. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, staff have any concerns or problems either way? We do have some staff members that have concerns, um, but we can set it up that they can come virtually if they if they wish to do that. I think we, I think this municipality would be willing to accommodate those staff who have concerns. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm fine with status quo. <laughs> that's that's five. Shall we just carry on? Are you okay with carrying on? I'm not going to voice my opinion if you don't want to voice yours. <laughs> I mean. Sir Tadden wants to hear my voice. Aww. Um, so, uh, I think we can stick with status quo, but I think we just need to be aware. Things change daily. Um, we are hearing more uh, cases, but in this area we aren't at this, at this point, but that can change quickly. Um, so I think we just have to kind of roll with it, and I think we're all willing to do whatever we need to do um, as time goes. And, and I concur. I just did. So the motion will, will read that council received the verbal update from the clerk's department direct staff to continue preparing for meetings at King Edward Park. Um, can, I just say continue meeting meetings at King Edward Park and further prepare for contingencies should well if I just say we continue meeting at King Edward Park you will prepare for contingencies if if we have to shut things down right just one more note go ahead that we are one of the very only council that's meeting with the public at this point other municipalities are doing it all virtually other, other than they will meet with council and then the public is virtual. So we're, we're kind of rare. We do, we do like to be accessible to the people as much as we can. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sure we can react fairly quickly should the area, I'm saying the area, even just if we see a concern, we can react pretty quick to, to change all that, so, and we should too, probably. Thanks. That motion is moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. I don't need to read it again, I don't think. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute recess because I need to get up out of this chair. So we will reconvene at 9 10 p.m. Thank you with our strategic plan and further that the creation of an outdoor recreational ice pad skating rink be considered by staff in the event the King Edward Park Arena remains closed for the 2020-2021 ice season. Now I understand that there were some amendments being considered by the mover and seconder. Councillor Rowley? Yes, thank you. And uh, I spoke with uh, Councillor Anderson uh, before our meeting started. Um, and there's been some conversation around this since we kind of put this out there, wondering if regardless of the fact that the ice is going into the arena, is it possible that we create an outdoor rink uh, anyway? Um, years ago, I know, Mary, you would know, and I know Brian too, uh, many winter fests we would have one out back somewhere behind the arena. Um, Wondering if it's possible, if or if at least we could have staff um, look into that possibility that we can do something and uh, how we would find the funds for whatever we would need. I'm sure we would need some 
lumber and boarding and things, but. Um, so may I make the final line um, that staff be directed to provide a report um, for an ice pad skating rink for the 2020-2021 season? Outdoor, yes, please. Does that make sense? Yeah, Council, that makes sense. Councilor Thank Anderson, you. does that work for you? Yeah, we were talking about the, uh, the amount of time that there is to put this together, too. It's uh, limited uh, if, we're, if it's going to come back to Council and process and everything. So uh, if there's enough time to do that, I, that's what I think we should do. And but maybe, if, if and there's a director in the room who can do it, and a location, it's Mr. Miller. So, <laughs> <laughs> and a location. Thank you, I, Mr. Miller. An appropriate location, just for skating. That's what I, I think the report would tell us where, uh, what the costs would be, and what we need to consider, and what probably we haven't considered just by putting words on a page. Right, Council and Rowe. and I've already talked with um, the deputy chief over there, who's said as in previous years as well. The, the fire department would certainly help out, Jim. So you've already got some manpower support there. So now we're just looking for uh, whatever else it is we need. I know where there's a pond. Sorry. <laughs> if, oh, I may, I think, if I may, if I may, we've done folks, it. That's I think comedy, you, you comedy. already took that off the table, though. I mean, option, <laughs> option two, option two clearly doesn't <laughs> talk about an ice skating surface at uh, that pond. Mr. Miller. If I may. You may. Um, I think last year, and a lot of it was due to the weather, was the first year we never had one. We've always had a, an arena, uh, a ice rink here. Uh, previous to this build, it was always out behind the Lions Hall. And then after that, we tried, attempted to uh, put a rink inside the uh, infield of the Upper Diamond through the uh, help of the, uh, the Volunteer Fire Department, which we're very thankful of. And uh, again, a lot of it has to do with just the weather. Um, you know, but we will attempt it all. I will do a report for sure for the, for the next meeting just to show everybody knows. Deputy Mayor? You want to vote? Okay, I just have to finish writing it. So the last line will read that council directs staff to provide a report to develop an outdoor recreational ice pad skating rink for the 2020-2021 ice season. Does that make sense? Councilor Anderson, any discussion? Councilor Bateman? I was just going, I, I like having a, an outdoor rink. I think everybody knows where I stand on new stuff, but I was gonna suggest if you would like to reach out to somebody that has a lot of expertise around it. You've met him from the pond hockey captain, Jeff Morehouse. He's the one that looks after the battle ball rinks and does an outstanding job. And he'd be more than happy to come to speak to anybody. We've talked about it before. So if, if you would like to have him come, he looks after those and they're fabulous. So and I don't know who looks after the ones in Castleton, but they're volunteer uh, that's operated all volunteer as, well, as well. So yeah, as our, yeah, that's the battle ball ones. Yeah. Councilor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. You would probably remember when there was a winter fest committee and it's always the weather whether we can do things but one year um, we had uh, someone just come and plow I mean it's a natural ice pond at the bay and uh, we don't have to put any money into it because you use the snow f all around for your area that you're trying to contain and uh, people just automatically went with shovels, which I did as a child and growing up. And then we had a, a pathway right over to uh, Whistling Duck now. Uh, and more people really enjoyed that because they could walk. Mm. And then they'd go have a hot chocolate, whatever. It helps the businesses. So I think if, if the weather permitted, we should consider doing that again. And it's, it's not very costly at all. And people do um, offer their service as volunteers at times. And I think as much as we can, we utilize the people that are interested. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Miller will include that kind of thing in the report. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say, make sure you include that Councillor Tadman offered to shovel it. <laughs> I would point out, Councillor Tadman, 
only mention that she used to do that in her youth. I would gladly shovel on alternate Purple. snowfalls as long as the deputy mayor would do the other ones. There you okay. go. There it is. All right. You include that in the report too as well, Mr. Miller. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion's carried. And our second motion is moved by Mayor Ostrander, second by Councillor Bateman. Whereas the municipality of Brighton has a communication policy, and whereas the purpose of the communication policy is to ensure efficient, effective, timely, and comprehensive communication to stakeholders of the municipality of Brighton, and whereas there have been concerns expressed by stakeholders in the community about various infrastructure projects, and whereas it has been the practice of staff to ensure that all members of council are copied on replies to emails to better keep council informed, therefore be it resolved that staff be directed to review and amend the communication policy to include a policy to provide communications to stakeholders who will be directly affected by infrastructure project construction, and further that staff be directed to include a policy that ensures that all members of council are copied on replies to emails in order to keep council well informed. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motions carried. The next item on our agenda is the council direction follow-up list. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The council receive the follow-up list for information purposes. Is there any discussion? Councillor Tadman. Thank you. Um, the uh, staff um, report of August the 17th, um, the Brighton Rotary, it, was that removed? Or, but we haven't heard anything else. I'm just wondering what were the results of that to begin with? I'm not sure what motion you're talking about. It's um, 17th of August, 2020. It says correspond items received, Brighton Rotary request to park rotary trailer in the arena parking lot for purposes of collecting empties. Did that happen? Mr. Miller? It was approved through motion and I did contact the Rotary to let them know that they could do it. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I continue or are we going to give someone else? Anyone else have any questions? Carry on, Councillor Tadman. The Hops Kiln, uh, I know I have a meeting tomorrow and I know that will be brought up um, so that's the last one, the hops kiln. Um, I think we were supposed to receive a, some kind of report on that from staff. Is there any? Mr. Kassman, are you aware of anything with, the, with regard to the hops kiln? Um, th through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Certainly that was an issue that was brought up uh, some time ago back in the uh, fall of uh, 19. I know that uh, uh, Mr. Hagerman has had uh, some or uh, attempted to have some uh, discussions with the principal involved with that and uh, uh, the file has gone quiet quite frankly and uh, the uh, principal has not come forward with uh, any new plans since our, uh, since our last discussion but I'll defer to Mr. Hagerman if he's got anything beyond that. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Hagerman? Uh, please, you, pl please. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I noticed the MBBR is not on here. It's just, um, it would be handy for us to have some updates on that. I know we do sometimes receive them through the mayor, but just on this report, until it's resolved, it's a big deal. Um, uh, it'd be great to have something on here um, regarding that. Mr. Castleman? Uh, that will be the, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that will be the subject of a uh, report on October 5th. Councillor Tadman. Thank you once again, Mayor. Um, in your update of last Friday, I believe it was, 
you said that there's a representative, or you had representatives with an S on the end, uh, and I'm not sure who's coming and why, what are they, something about dewatering or something, what, what is that all about? And why is that happening? Oh, first of all, the tender went out for the MBBR. And when is that going to be finalized? Mr. Castleman? The end of November. Uh, my recollection is it's uh, in around November 10th or 12th that it closes, approximately. And so what you brought up in as an update for us in Council, I don't understand why they are coming if we're doing the MBBR at this point, and we put out so, tenders. M Mr. Graham, who is our engineer on that project, will be um, coming to provide a report on what's been happening in the meantime. Okay. So, can I finish? Sure. I, I would like to see on the update, uh, and as soon as possible, and if it needs a motion, which it probably does, that we need to have a report of what's happening down there because I don't know it's been over a year since I've heard what the levels our big level problems are and uh, of ammonia and we haven't had any update whatsoever and I know that there was some health problems with Mr. Graham's wife or whatever but this this has gone on way too long for us not even to know how our our waste management is is doing so can we can if I can move a motion I'd like to have that on on here and get a staff report it's coming on October 5th Mr. Graham is coming on October 5th to provide us with an update well that's the first time I've heard that that's the third time it's been said tonight I mean except for tonight so um, if it's definitely coming on the 5th then Will staff also be giving in a report, or is this just through Mr. Graham? Mr. Castleman? I think it'll be through you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think it'd be one and the same. Okay, I'll see what happens on the 5th. Mr. Councillor LeBlanc, sorry. Through you, Mayor, for uh, either Preston or the CAO. Uh, if they're going to, staff is going to bring a report, in that report, could we go back uh, five months on the decanting and have the SVI, the Imhoff cone test, the 30 minute settling test? Can, can you use English for the rest of us? Just right. for fun. The sludge volume index, the Imhoff tone test, which tells them the amount of organic, 30 minute settling test, tells them how, how a secondary clarifier would work, uh, and the ammonia levels and influent and effluent coming out of the aeration pond and the one leaving the, uh, the lagoon. If you could ha have that for uh, at least five months. I, I trust, Mr. Castleman, this will be a fulsome report. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor of receiving the council follow a direction follow-up list. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion is carried. There's nothing under unfinished business, so we move into bylaws. Thank you. Are you moving that? Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, and I'll need a seconder that Council extends this meeting. to its natural conclusion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bateman, any discussion? All in favor? Is there any opposed? Motion's carried. So we move into bylaws, and uh, Mr. Walsh, I'll just need you to remind me which ones need to be amended so we can make that note. First one is with regard to the um, agreement with ML Consulting, moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson. The Council gives a bylaw. It's for second and third reading and finally passes on this date. 
being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement for the completion of pay equity audits for the union, non-union, and the library board employees between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and ML Consulting. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Next is a bylaw with regard to Dr. Lambracos's lease. It's moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute a lease agreement between Angela Lambracos and the municipality of Brighton for space leased at the Brighton Health Services Center. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. Next bylaws with regard to appointment of fence viewers. It's moved by Councillor Anderson, second by Councillor Bateman. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to appoint fence viewers for the municipality of Brighton. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And the next is with regard to a bylaw for the naming of a highway and that will have to read as amended. The changes made in our document. Thank you. It's moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The council gives a bylaw a first a first, second and third reading and finally passes on this state being a bylaw uh, to, to naming a highway. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And a bylaw with regard to the Hazelwood Road closure. And is this one amended as well appropriately? Yes, please, Mayor. So, so the amendment would involve uh, amending the bylaw to remove the sixth paragraph, beginning mm -hmm. with the word whereas, to reconcile its legal description to be the same as that in the title. And secondly, to remove the second last and whereas, since this is a technical bylaw amendment and notice to the public was not required. Thank you. So I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson and seconded by Councillor Bateman that council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes this date, being a bylaw to stop up and close a portion of an unopened road allowance as shown as part eight on plan 38R, 3554, Municipality of Brighton. And gentlemen, I've added as amended to that. I trust you're okay with that, Councillor Anderson, Councillor Bateman, and you will provide those amendments to the clerk's office, thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And a motion with regard to the regulation and control of vehicular parking, moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink, that Council gives a bylaw, its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to amend and update bylaw 126, 2016, the bylaw to regulate and control vehicular parking on municipal property. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And we did not add this to the agenda, but we did um, remove it from the closed session. So it's moved by Councilor LeBlanc, seconded by Councilor Rowley. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading. And finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to amend the existing agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and the Brighton and District Curling Club. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. We have no reports of advisory committees of council. We have no reports or minutes of statutory committees, boards, or external agencies. We have removed the correspondence at the request of the Legion. So move into FYI correspondence. 
The first is from Mike and Carol Dryden regarding Harbor Point Pond. It's moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Council Rowley, that Council received the correspondence from Mike and Carol Dryden regarding Harbor Point Pond. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Second is from Cheryl Langevin regarding the COVID-19 response, uh, crisis and support for Brighton citizens. And it's moved by Council Rowley and I'll need a seconder that Council receive the correspondence from Cheryl Langevin regarding COVID-19 crisis and support for Brighton citizens. Is there a seconder? Councilor Bateman? Is there any discussion? Councilor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would just like to make a, a couple of comments, and this is certainly not to say that I'm not sensitive to the struggles that people in our municipality are going through, but um, I did have a conversation maybe about six weeks back with uh, Ms. Whittefield. It's too bad she, she's not here, but I, I did ask that question. Um, have we uh, had any uh, requests for, uh, from... Um, from residents who are struggling to pay not only their water sewer or their tax bill this year. Up until um, the time that I spoke with her, um, she, she had not had uh, any requests for, uh, any, for anyone, for, for whether forgivable late fees or anything. The other thing I'd like to say too, uh, Ms. Langevin um, mentions the food bank. Uh, and as you know, I've uh, been a board member and a volunteer for the food bank for um, for, for a very long time. And I should say that uh, up until now, um, we have had uh, great support from the community, but I should say up until now, although we expect that to change, that we've had um, no increase in um, clients that we, uh, that we serve. Um, we expect that to change as winter comes along. It, al it always does. But um, not to say that people aren't struggling, and as I said uh, at the beginning, not that I'm not sensitive to those kind of things, but um, up until now, um, that's kind of where it's going. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tadman. Um, I, I understand that your reasoning for the way you want to just receive this, but I certainly um, would like to see a report come from our financial director and options if the need arises. Um, we have a contingency reserve. We, we have a very generous um, population in Brighton that uh, I know if, if there was a need. So there's lots of ways that uh, we can help some of these people. And I do know that, that people are, are struggling and struggling to put food on the table and worrying that they're going to be booted out of their rental. So I think for me personally, I would like to see if there's just some options available in, in the di dire needs of some of our residents. Thank so you. I won't be voting to receive this. Councillor Rowley, this is a motion to receive. Are you comfortable with that? Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Bateman? I was just going to say, it might be something you have to address as the pandemic unfolds, because as you see the numbers going up, but you also have to keep in mind, you might not see people asking for forgiveness in taxes and an increase in the food bank because everybody was receiving, well, not everybody, but a majority that were impacted were receiving the CERB payments. So if and when they dry up and stop is when you'll see the true impact of COVID-19. So. And to uh, Councillor Rowley's point, I think we, we're we sort of anticipating that to come by as the snow begins to fly too, right? Right, Perfect storm, so to speak. Deputy Mayor? I just want to add to that that I think it's our responsibility each individually as citizens to support those in need through the services that we do have in Brighton as well. Um, I certainly want to help, and, and but I think that as council, sometimes our hands are tied as far as what we can do, but, but that doesn't mean that we can't help and we can't encourage that sort of action as well, and I really want to see us doing that. Um, I, I don't think we've seen the full impact yet, and I think we will for sure, so um, 
Yeah, I'll leave it there for now. We, we certainly, these are, these are discussions we can have, but, but I think we need to really be encouraging each other, or maybe as a group we can do something, I don't know, to fundraise, but uh, uh, it can't always come from taxpayers' dollars. You know what I mean? It's coming from one and going to the, the other when we, when we reduce things. So uh, it's a bit of a struggle for us here, but there are other ways that we can make this happen, I believe. Thank you. Councillor Bateman? Uh, kind of related, but uh, for the food bank, because uh, Emily, you're involved. Do you know if the holiday, holiday train is still going to be running during COVID? Because that's uh, really a big fundraiser for you. I, I've, uh, I've been corresponding with uh, the CP group, but they, uh, they haven't. I, my guess is it's probably not. Um, uh, you know, if we, if we get the stop, I, I don't care if we get the stop this year, if we have to control the crowds, but as long as we get the check, we're good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Councillor Tadman. Last meeting, we um, forgave the membership um, problems that they were having at the Y. And the people I'm talking about can't afford a membership to the Y. So, and there's other there's other areas where we spend money to help us, like um, the curling club, for instance. Even though we own the building, but we've just passed um, a lot of help to them, I'll put it that way, instead of going into detail. So my heart goes out to a small child that's going to school, and if you go and talk to the principal of the three schools, the public schools that we represent, those kids are going there, even before COVID hungry, and they're supplying uh, food for them for the morning. So the, the kids at the Beacon are suffering. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's one area where we can as a council help out and encourage those who wish to, to offer whatever that happens to be helped that way. So no, I definitely will not vote to receive it. Thank you. Anything further? Go ahead, Councillor Rowley. I, um, because I like being a social convener, I want to kind of um, offer something to uh, the deputy mayor. Can we sit afterwards and come up with some kind of Christmas challenge this year for council? There you go. Councillor Tadman. Certainly I would be willing to forfeit my pay for a councillor, whatever you come up with, because I do, my, I do feel sorry for these people, and I know what poverty looks like. I experience it as a child. Thank you. Anything further? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. And the final piece of correspondence is from Paul Langevin regarding Harbor Point Pond. And it's moved by Council Rowley, and I'll need a seconder that Council receive correspondence from Paul Langevin regarding Harbor Point Pond. Councilor Bateman seconds. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Which brings us to question period. If anyone in the public has any questions with regard to an item on our agenda, please come forward. None noted. And so we'll move into closed session with a motion moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Council Rowley. The Council resolve itself into closed session September 21st, 2020 at 9.40 p.m. Pursuant to the Ontario Municipal Act 2001, subsection 239-2B, personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, being a lease agreement and cannabis issues, and a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, being the industrial park lands. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried.